a flow to history and culture. This flow is rooted in what people think. And what they think will determine how they act. There is violence and a breakdown in society up to the point in which it's unsafe to walk through the streets in many of the cities of the world. On the other hand, there is a danger of an increasing authoritarianism to meet the threat of chaos in our own countries and internationally. Should we despair and give in? If not, how should we then live? The answer as to whether we should throw up our hands and give in is no. There are good and sufficient reasons for this. We can receive help from a quarter, which would be unexpected to most modern men. But to understand how, we have to delve back into history. I will begin with the time of the Romans, because the Roman civilization is the direct ancestor of the modern European world. From the time of the earliest conquests under the Republic, right down to our own day, Roman law and Roman political ideas have influenced the European scene, the whole Western civilization. The Roman Empire was great, both in size and military strength. It reached out over much of the known world. Its roads led over all of Europe, the Near East, and North Africa. All the way from Hadrian's Wall, which was built to keep out the Scots, who were too tough to conquer, to the forts on the Rhine River, to the north of Africa, to the Euphrates River, and the Caspian Sea. In one conquest, the Roman legions crossed the Alps, came down the Rhone Valley, past the peaks of the Domitii, to that place which is now called Vevey in Switzerland. For a time, the Helvetians, the principal inhabitants of Switzerland, held them in check and made the proud Romans pass under the yoke, ironically imitating the custom of the Romans, who had the warriors they conquered pass under a yoke. This was a temporary reversal. Not much could hold back the Roman legions, neither difficult terrain nor the armies of their enemies. They passed up over the hills and conquered the ancient Helvetian capital, Aventicum, today called Avanche. One can imagine a Roman legionnaire who slogged home from the vastness of the north as he mounted the hill and looked down on Avanche, a little Rome, as it were, with its amphitheater, its theater, and its temples. I love Avanche. It contains some of my favorite Roman ruins north of the Alps. Some have said, although I think it's a high figure, that at one time, 40,000 Romans lived here. The opulence of Rome was here at Avanche. This gold bust of Marcus Aurelius was found here. Rome left its magnificent treasures in art and architecture across the whole empire.
In many ways, Rome was great, but it had no real answers to the basic problems that all humanity faces. When a culture tries to build only on its military strength, very, very soon, these will prove not to be sufficient for the simple reason that without a sufficient base of knowing what is right, what is wrong, why we should do certain things in contrast to why we should do certain others, no amount of military might is sufficient. Rome first tried to build upon the decisions of accepted citizens of the Republic and later on the decisions of its emperors. But the attempt ultimately failed because it was not a sufficient base on which to build a society. And they never had the kind of democracy we have where everybody shares in it. But for those who were the real citizens of the state, um, they just tried to build on their opinions and this totally failed. And then they turned to their gods this is the goddess Diana, whose temple was in Ephesus, which is in modern Turkey. The Romans, like the Greeks before them, also tried to build upon their gods in the hope of having something big enough upon which to rest their society. But their gods were not big enough because they were finite. That is, they were limited. They were like bigger men and women, not basically different from human men and women. They were amplified humanity, not divinity. This being so, the Romans had no sufficient base intellectually. That is, they did not have anything big enough or permanent enough to which to relate either their thinking or their life. Therefore, they had no value system strong enough to bear the strains of life, either individual or political. All their gods together could not give them a sufficient base for life, morals, values, or final decisions. The Romans made their own gods depending upon their society, and when the society tumbled, their gods tumbled with them. Thus, the Roman experiment in social harmony, based on an elitist republic, ultimately failed. The Senate no longer could keep order. Armed gangs terrorized the city of Rome, and the normal functions of government were disrupted as rivals fought for power. Self-interest took the place of social interest, no matter how sophisticated the traffic. Thus, in desperation, the people accepted authoritarian government. In the days of Julius Caesar, Rome turned to an authoritarian system centered in Caesar himself. As Plutarch put it, the Romans made Caesar dictator for life in the hope that the government of a single person would give them time to breathe after so many civil wars and calamities. This was indeed a tyranny avowed since his power now was not only absolute, but perpetual, too. After Caesar's death, Octavian, later called Caesar Augustus, grandnephew of Caesar, came to power. The great Roman poet Virgil, friend of Augustus, wrote in his Aeneid, saying that Augustus was a divinely appointed leader, and that Rome's mission was to bring peace and civilization to the world. Because Augustus offered external and internal peace, while keeping the outward forms of legal constitutionality, Romans of every class were ready to allow him total power in order to restore and assure the functioning of the political system, of business, and the affairs of daily life. After 12 BC, he became the head of the state religion with the title Pontifex Maximus. All men were urged to worship the spirit of Rome, and the genius of the emperor. Later, this became obligatory for all the people of the empire. And later still, the emperors simply ruled as gods. Augustus tried to legislate morals and family life, 
Later, emperors tried impressive legal reforms and welfare programs. But a human god was a poor foundation, and Rome fell. It is important to realize the difference a people's worldview makes to their strength as they're exposed to the pressures of life. In the Roman era, we must understand that when one became a Christian, it meant that he stood not only opposed to the surrounding religions, but the entire culture built on those religions. Back in the Roman days, when a person became a Christian and was marked as a Christian by baptism, it was a very short step at times from the open profession of faith to the martyr's death. Rome was cruel, and its cruelty could perhaps be best pictured by the events which took place in the Roman arenas. For example, the gladiator one sees in the statue. Or the Christians thrown to the beasts as people watched. Let us not forget why the Christians were killed. They were not killed because they worshiped Jesus. At that time, many religions were practiced in the Roman world. Some were called the mystery religions. Here, for example, we can see one of the initiatory rites practiced by one of these religions depicted in this Roman house in Pompeii. Nobody cared who worshiped whom. As long as the unity of the estate was maintained, centered in the worship of the emperor. The Christians were killed because they were rebels. And this was especially so as they lost the support of the Jewish synagogues, and therefore the immunity which the Jews had since the time of uh, Caesar. We may express the nature of this rebellion in two ways, both of which are true. We can say they worship Jesus as God, and they worship the personal, infinite God only. This worshiping of the one God only, Caesar could not tolerate. It was counted as treason. This became a special threat to the unity of the state based on emperor worship during the reign of Diocletian in the third century, when people of the higher classes began to become Christians in larger numbers. In the Roman era, when one became a Christian, it meant that he stood not only opposed to the surrounding religions, but the entire culture built on those religions. The early church believed that Jesus was the Old Testament prophesied Messiah, and that he had come, and that he had died in substitution on the cross. The second thing, however, is something that we're apt to forget, and that is that they really did believe <clears throat> that the Old Testament and the revelation in Christ and the growing New Testament, it was growing then, of course, say the first century, was God who had spoken, and that God had given truth, and as such, they were not caught in the flux of the uh, relativistic Roman world, because it really was relativistic, much like our own day. A weak base for a culture or an individual can only stand when the pressures are not too great. As an illustration, let us take this bridge. The Romans built many little humpback bridges like this over the streams of Europe. 
People and wagons went over them safely for centuries, for two millennia. But now, if someone would drive a heavily loaded truck over these, they would break. It is this way with the lives and value systems of individuals and cultures. If they have nothing stronger to build upon than their own finiteness, their own limitedness, they can stand if the pressures are not too great. But as the pressures mount, if they do not have a sufficient base, they crash, just as these Roman bridges would crash if someone drove over them with a modern 10-ton truck. Culture and the freedoms of men are fragile. If there's not a sufficient base, it only takes time, and often not a great deal of time, before there is a collapse. In catacombs such as these here in Rome, the Christians buried their dead and met for worship. That it was the Christians who were able to resist the religious mixtures, syncretism, and the effects of the weaknesses of Roman culture speaks of the strength of the Christian worldview. This strength rested on God being an infinite personal God and that he had spoken in the Old Testament the revelation through Christ and the gradually growing New Testament, and that he had spoken in a way that people could understand. This meant that they not only had knowledge about the universe and mankind, which people could not find out by themselves, but they had absolute universal values by which to live and by which to judge the state in which they lived. And people are unique in being made in the image of God. There was a reason for the basic dignity and value of each individual. If they had worshipped Jesus and Caesar, they would have gone unharmed. But they worshipped one God only and rejected all forms of syncretism. There was no mixture. All other gods were seen as false gods. Or we can express why they were killed in another way. No totalitarian authority, no authoritarian state can tolerate those who have an absolute by which to judge that state and its actions. Christians had a universal standard by which to judge not only personal morals, but the state. So they were counted as the enemy of totalitarian Rome. Though many of the Christians were martyred, they had the answer, which the Romans did not have, as the Romans tried to build upon the state or upon their limited gods. The Christians continued to grow in numbers and continued in history. The Romans had the Christian answers before them, but they turned from that base, which would have given their society the answers they needed, and their society collapsed. As their empire ground down, the Romans and their decadence were given to a great thirst for violence and the gratification of their senses, as in their rampant sexuality. Here in Pompeii, a century or so after the Republic had ceased to exist, the Phallus cult was strong. 
paintings and statuary of exaggerated sexual content adorn the houses of the affluent. Not all the art in Pompeii was like this, but that which was of sexual representation was just plain blatant. Rome collapsed, not from external, but from internal weaknesses. Even though Emperor Constantine ended the persecution of the Christians, and Christianity became a legal religion in 313 AD, and the official state religion of the empire in 381 AD, the majority of the people went on in their old ways. Apathy was the chief mark of the period. The elite abandoned intellectual life for their social life. Apathy also showed itself in the arts with a lack of creativity. Officially sponsored art became decadent. The music became increasingly bombastic. Look at these fourth century works here on the Arch of Constantine. And in contrast, these handsome second century works of art taken from earlier monuments from the period of Emperor Trajan. This portrait of Emperor Valtinian is so much inferior to this likeness of Emperor Nero, which was minted 300 years earlier. All of life was marked by the prevailing apathy. And as the Roman economy slumped lower and lower, burdened by a costly government and by inflation, authoritarianism increased in order to try to set off the apathy. And as less people were inclined to work, the state took over more and more, and more freedoms were lost. For example, laws were passed binding the small farmer to his land. And because of the apathy and its results, and the oppression, few people thought the old civilization was worth saving. Rome did not collapse because of outward forces such as the barbarians, but because of inward rottenness. And Rome gradually became a ruin. The conclusion I draw looking at the Roman era is the fact that nothing humanistic provides a strong enough base for society as well as the individual life of the uh, individual man and woman. The Greeks and the Romans tried magnificently to first build on society, on those people who made up their society, which is an exclusive elitist society. But those people, uh, they tried to build on this and totally failed. And then they tried to build on finite gods gods that were not the infinite personal god. And this equally failed. It, it brings a simple conclusion. There is no foundation strong enough for society uh, within the realm of finiteness and beginning for man alone and is autonomous. And the other side, of course, is that the Christians were able to stand. But the, the reason they were able to resist the syncretism of that day and the breakdown and face the arena, uh, really face it uh, with certainty, is because they began in exactly the opposite place. They began with the existence of an infinite personal God and that he had spoken and they had the truth in the Old and the Testament, in the revelation of Christ, and in the growing, the then growing, a New Testament.
Rome fell because of the internal degeneration of the entire Roman system, the empire fell. There followed a time of political, social, and intellectual turmoil, and then a gradual cultural awakening, the Middle Ages. While there was a decline in learning in the West, old manuscripts of the Greek and Latin classics, as well as the Bible, were kept, copied, and recopied. However, the original pristine Christianity of the New Testament gradually became distorted. The first century church, of course, was a very simple church. They met in homes and usually not in large numbers. together in these small groups. It centered around the singing of psalms and hymns. It centered around the breaking of bread, the communion. The first century church centered around, most of all, the preaching of the Bible as the absolute infallible word of God. If you read the book of Acts, for example, you find a tremendous emphasis on content. It wasn't religious, as 20th century men thinks are religious, of something uh, just what I would call in the area of non-reason. It really was down into the area of content. It had to do with Christ rose from the dead in space and time. It had to do with the fact that the Old Testament was the Word of God. And what these people really believed was in the truth of this, not the religiousness of it, and not even basically the religious experience of it, but the truth of it. Look at these Christian catacomb paintings done prior to the Middle Ages. Even if simply portrayed, these are real people living in a real world. This vitality and livingness can be paralleled with the living Christianity of the early church. But gradually, there was a change from the early Christianity. There was also a change in art. These are no longer real people, but symbols. There was a contrast to the early Christian art. By the sixth century, the last vestiges of modern realism were abandoned, says Michael Goh, in The Origins of Christian Art. There is beauty here, and these artists work with devotion, looking for more spiritual values. But in doing so, their art changed. This came to its climax in the ninth to the 11 centuries. I would like to go back for a few moments to the early days of the Middle Ages. The early Christian church had turned away from the old Roman music because of its associations with the Roman social practices and the pagan religious rites. There were strong human elements in some of the music of the early church.
We can think, for example, of Ambrose, Bishop of Milan in the fourth century, who wrote hymns and taught his people to sing them. This was an innovation in his day. Later, under Pope Gregory, there was a change to what we today call the Gregorian chant. Impersonal, mystical, and otherworldly. days Christians had struggled with a response to Christ's prayer that they be in the world but not of it. This challenged the Christian's attitude to material possessions and style of living. In the early church believers were noted for their open-handed generosity. Their enemies admitted it. But in the Middle Ages, the pendulum swung back and forth between utter disregard of the command to live modestly, caring for the poor, and the early monastic ideal to have no money at all. The papal court was properly rebuked for its material lust. John of Salisbury told the Pope to his face the people thought that the Roman church, which is the mother of all churches, behaves more like a stepmother than a mother. The scribes and Pharisees sit there, placing on men's shoulders burdens too heavy to be borne. They load themselves with fine clothes and their tables with precious plates. A poor man can seldom gain admittance. In the midst of all this, Francis of Assisi, recognizing the corrupting effects of money, forbade his followers to receive money at all. Side by side, there were the luxury and the practical materialism of the papal court and the monastic orders, which gradually became centers of overwhelming wealth. The church and medieval society making attempts to curb the economic excesses of society. First, trying to prohibit, and then later limiting the interest rates on loans. Then, with the support of the secular rulers, attempting to enforce just prices. Medieval economic teaching exalted the virtue of honest work, well executed. when old age or infirmity made it impossible for the people of the Middle Ages to work, the church often provided them with hospitals and other charitable institutions. This hospital was open here in Siena in the Middle Ages, much as it is today. And while the modern patients in the 20th century may be glad for the modern medical advances, at the same time, they may admire the superior artistic taste uh, of the old Sienese interior decorators. On another level, the challenge to be in the world, but not of it, could raise the issue of God's law as against the law of the state. The early church had no problem in the confusion between church and state, because until the time of Constantine, the state was definitely built upon an unchristian base. But in the Middle Ages, the problem was much more complicated. 
You see, Europe was considered as Christ's kingdom, Christendom. Only the baptized person was really a full member of the European society. Thus, it could be said that it was as though the state itself was baptized or consecrated. Individually, this meant an even more complex problem in regard to the state. This is Lorenzetti's allegory of good and bad government. It is in the council chamber of the town hall of Siena. It is from the 14th century. Bad government over here, with the devil presiding over all those vices which destroy community. And here, good government and the Christian virtues from which flow all those activities among men which manifest man's oneness under God. The confusion in human government certainly existed in the Middle Ages when the state and church became intertwined. This is the ideal of life under good government, going on uninterrupted. Look at these ordinary people portrayed in this marvelous fresco, able to pursue their everyday lives protected by good government from chaos and violence. However, as the artist himself knew from the turbulent political history of Siena itself, if the sources of good and evil were distinct, the effects were a jumbled mixture, humanly, of good and bad intentions. Remembering that the church was everywhere in Europe, it was not surprising that the church worked along with society as a whole, and especially through society's leaders. A prime example is Charlemagne, son of Pippin. He became king of the Franks in 771 AD and gained control over much of the territory of the former Roman Empire. His coronation by the Pope as a Roman-style emperor followed easily. In return, he supplied a strong land base for the Pope in Italy, and he supported missionary activities in the areas which he conquered, for example, among the Germanic tribes. He also made tithing compulsory, and this supplied funds for church administration. Charlemagne built impressive churches. This one is the Palatine Chapel in Aachen, the city where Charlemagne had his home in his old age. Thus church and state power coexisted, as well as feeding each other culturally. The time of Charlemagne was a step forward culturally. The art objects were not large, but they were exquisite. To call the period that produced them the Dark Ages, as the humanists of the Renaissance later did, would be totally incorrect. Charlemagne encouraged scholars. Learning experienced a restirring through sheer industry, enthusiasm, and systematic propagation. The scholar Alcuin, 50 years old at the time, came all the way from York in northern England to become Charlemagne's advisor and head of his palace school. Charlemagne and his scholar courtiers laid a base for unified ideas throughout Western Europe, aided by the beautiful Carolinian minuscule script, which was widely copied. All of Charlemagne's scholars were of the clergy. Learning was not general. It seems that though Charlemagne could read, he could not write. Then gradually came a period of further awakening of cultural thought and an awakened piety and a slow moving forward to the two great contrasting movements which mar so mark history right up to our own day. First, the humanistic elements of the Renaissance and secondly, the Reformation. It would be impossible to discuss the growing culture in the Middle Ages without looking carefully at the architecture of the time. 
This is the White Tower of the Tower of London, in which is the Chapel of St. John. At this time, Romanesque architecture was being born, a leap forward in cultural awakening. Romanesque owes much to the Roman form, but added its own flavor as well. The rounded arch, thick walls, the dim interiors. This magnificent rib vault ceiling located at Durham Cathedral prepared the ground in a very real way for Gothic architecture. The Abbey of Saint Denis, just outside of Paris, was built by Abbot Suger in 1140, another leap forward in the awakened culture of the Middle Ages. This is indeed the birthplace of the Gothic. Notice the pointed arches at the Cathedral of Chartres. Notre Dame gives us an example of the Gothic flying buttresses. Saint-Chapelle in Paris shows the Gothic high windows, large windows, many windows, and the wonder of the rose window. But the church was moving increasingly away from the teaching of early Christianity. In the early church, the authority rested on the Bible alone. But in the Middle Ages, there gradually had come a change, with the authority divided between the Bible and the church. Then came Thomas Aquinas, a Dominican monk. He was the outstanding theologian of that period, and his thinking still has much influence. He had an incomplete view of the fall of man, as man had revolted against God. In his view, the human will was fallen or corrupted, but the intellect was not. As a result of this emphasis, gradually philosophy began to act in an increasingly independent, autonomous manner. More and more, the teachings of the Bible and those of the classical non-Christian philosophers were freely mixed. He reintroduced the teaching of the Greek philosopher Aristotle, although Pope Urban IV had previously forbidden it. Because Aquinas emphasized Aristotle, a problem was raised which later became crucial in the humanistic elements of the Renaissance. Aristotle emphasized the individual things around us, the particulars. This cot is a particular. The molecules which make up this cot are particulars, and you and I are particulars. Beginning from man alone, and from the individual things in the world, that is the particulars, the problem then is how to find an ultimate and adequate meaning for the individual things. And most important, how to find a meaning for man and for life. And what will be man's basis for morals, value, and law. Later, the mixture of biblical teaching and non-Christian philosophy led to the question, is the Bible really necessary? Since truth could seemingly be reached without it. What has happened, of course, is that Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages has opened the floodgates in his uh, emphasis on uh, Aristotle and on the particulars. And as this is done, philosophy is increasingly made free from anything that God has said. And as such, we find uh, that man begins to take over and place himself at the center.
Increasingly, the authority of the church took precedence over the teaching of the Bible. And it was emphasized more and more that salvation rests on people meriting the merit of Christ instead of on Christ's work alone. Gradually there grew up a humanistic element, and that is what the church decided was made equal with what the, the Bible decided. And this just changed everything because then everything could be brought in and anything could be brought in. Uh, for example, it immediately led to a different emphasis on how to approach God through man's added works to the merit of Christ as well as um, the merit of Christ itself. And all kinds of things changed. But at the same time, there began to develop a reaction against these distortions of the original Christianity. John Wycliffe, an Oxford professor of the 14th century, raised his voice. He said, The Bible is the supreme authority. His translation of the Bible into English had an important influence throughout Europe. John Hus of Czechoslovakia said, the Bible is the only final authority. Man must return to God through the work of Christ only. And Wycliffe, when he came forward, and Hus, uh, really understood uh, that the deviation had come at a central point, and that central point was the lack of having the Bible as the only authority. And one must say about Christianity two things. The heart of the Christian message is that through the substitutionary death of Christ, we can return to God, and our true moral guilt is removed on the basis of Christ's work. But on the other hand, as far as facing humanism is concerned, the central thing is not the acceptance of Christ as Savior, but the fact that we have absolute truth in contrast to relative truth. And this is the real tension. Uh, are we merely beginning with man as autonomous? Or is the truth uh, from a personal God uh, that uh, gives us real absolutes? And therefore, we're not only dealing with statistical averages. Now, this has a tremendous impact in the area of morals, in the impact of law and political life, as well as religious life. It's not minimizing at all the acceptance of Christ as Savior. It's quite contrary. There is no other way to come to God except on the basis of his finished work. But unless this is framed in the concept that we're talking about truth and not just an endless series of relativistic things, uh, merely talking about accepting Christ as Savior will never meet the humanist dilemma. There is only one real solution, and that's right back where the early church was. The early church believed that only the Bible was the final authority. And what these people really believed, and it gave them their whole strength, was in the truth of the Bible as the absolute infallible Word of God.
Now we come to the Renaissance. It's one of the great periods of the history of man. And as far as its artworks are concerned, it's one of mankind's glories. Anyone who can walk through the museums and not be overwhelmed with the beauty of the work of its art in many, many different mediums really is a very poor man indeed. And yet at the same time, we have to keep in mind that in the flow of the thought of man, it opens the door for humanist man in a new way and carries this further and throws the doors wide open uh, that for all those problems that bring us right up into the period of modern man. through history, the artists have done two things. They have reflected their culture, sometimes much more accurately than the writers, even the philosophers. And secondly, often they provide the way for the next step of, that's coming in culture. So sometimes they're a prophet, but always they're exhibiting that which is the culture of that day. The change that came with the Renaissance can clearly be observed in art. Up to that time, Florentine painting had been like Byzantine art, but even less polished, flat and without depth. And people were not portrayed realistically as real people. Then came Giotto, and with him, radical change. He was commissioned to paint The Last Judgment. And in it, he did a realistic portrait of his patron, Enrico Scrovini, the man who paid for the work. Nature was given its proper place. Proper, because nature is important as God made the world, and proper in the sense that nature is portrayed as it really is. On the other hand, his people are much too large for the scale of the world around them. Look at this bridge. How could this man fit into this observation platform or aim a bow and arrow out of this window? The same man who painted this designed the beautiful bell tower, the Campanile, next to the cathedral in Florence, a painter who creates buildings. We now come to a great breakthrough in Renaissance art. Masaccio, a friend of Brunelleschi, used real live faces in his work, which gave a lifelike quality to it which was unique in his day. The painters who preceded Masaccio, including his own teacher, Marcelino, painted their figures seemingly on tiptoe. Masaccio had the feet of his people planted firmly on the ground. Masaccio was first to consistently use central perspective. This was a clear step ahead of the Romans, who only knew a different kind of perspective. By painting in the round, and by the use of the new perspective, his people were in the midst of realized space. There was actually space around the people. But for the men of the Renaissance, it was something more. It placed man in the center of that space, a space subordinated to the mathematical principles that came out from the mind of man.
Here is a true portrait of nature. Nature has its proper place in the world which God has made. The writers wrote the way the painters painted. Dante, in whose house I am at Florence, was an early and ideal example of this. His work was genius at its highest level. And the good master studying that train said, look there at that great soul that approaches and seems to shed no tears for all his pain. What kingliness moves with him even in hell? It is Jason, who by courage and good advice made off with a Colchian ram. He made more room for nature, but following the influence of Thomas Aquinas, he mixed the Christian and the classical world. In his divine comedy, the greatest sinners were Judas who betrayed Jesus and Brutus and Cassius who betrayed Caesar. In his own life, the problem of individual things versus meaning and values was clearly demonstrated. He loved Beatrice, whom he actually only saw a couple of times in his life and held up their love as the romantic ideal. Seeing her face that is so fair to see, love sheds such perfect sweetness over me. But he married quite a different woman who never had any place in his poetry. Her business was to rear his children and to cook. Although the writers of the time understood that sensual love required the spiritual, if it was to be more than merely a physical response of the passing moment, yet nevertheless, they allowed these two to be divided into two parts, the physical love and the idealized spiritual love. For Dante and the other writers of his time, they had two views of love. One, the idealized spiritual love directed toward a disembodied phantom, and the other, a dray horse of a woman who kept her man's house and shared his bed. This produced not beauty, but ugliness. The Dome of Florence. Brunelleschi designed and built it. It brought together great artistic triumph with an overwhelming feat of engineering. What is especially overwhelming is that Brunelleschi was trained not as an architect, but as a goldsmith. This building, the Foundling Hospital, which you are now looking at, was also designed by Brunelleschi and was the first Renaissance building. emphasis was placed upon man. We know very little about those who built the Gothic cathedrals, or who wrote the Gregorian chants, but now the artist himself became important. Here is a biography of Brunelleschi, and some of his contemporaries wrote autobiographies. Sculptures, portraits, and even self-portraits of the artists began to be made. At the beginning of the Renaissance, it could have gone either way. Nature could have had its proper place. Man could have been in his proper place and would have been absolutely beautiful. But at a certain point along in the Renaissance, uh, the scales ticked, and man put himself at the center absolutely. And this opened the door completely uh, to the whole destructive force of humanism that followed down through the Enlightenment and, and into our own day. Music was another large and important area in the time of the Renaissance.
composers of the Renaissance invented the art of orchestration. Not only did each instrument play a different voice, but a different melody line. The North influenced the South, not only in painting, but in music. String instruments of the Renaissance were built in matched sets so that the timber was uniform from bass right through the soprano instrument. Music was printed with movable type for the first time. This is the lute, the most popular solo instrument of the Renaissance. The sackbut, like our trombone. The viol, ancestor of our viola. The crumb horn. And the spinet. Up to this time, things could have gone in one of two ways. There could have been an emphasis on real people living in a real world which God had made in which all individual things had importance because God had made the whole world. Or humanism could have taken over with its emphasis on the individual things being autonomous. But the die was cast. Man made himself increasingly independent. He made himself his own measure. He tried to make himself autonomous. The humanistic man of the Renaissance thought of the time before him as something unsavory, something to be forgotten. To him, it was the Dark Ages. And he thought of his own age as a great leap forward into his own period of rebirth or Renaissance. A rebirth of the pre-Christian golden age of ancient Greece and Rome. Thomas Aquinas had opened the door for this with his emphasis upon the teaching of Aristotle. This is a fresco painted by Raphael in the Vatican. It is called the School of Athens. The central figures in this fresco are Plato and Aristotle. Raphael painted the hands of these two men to represent their philosophic emphases. Plato, with his finger pointing upward, emphasized absolutes, ideals, meaning, value. But Aristotle, with his hand spread downward, emphasized the individual things, the particulars, nature, man. But what is the meaning of particulars, including me and you, if they have nothing, no final thing to be related to, so that they have meaning. And how do we know concerning our individual acts, whether they're right or wrong, if there is no absolute to give a certainty? The dilemma between any form of humanism uh, and uh, biblical Christianity, it really rests at the question of whether we have to begin from man alone as autonomous and then build everything from that or whether there's truth from another source which is an absolute truth and which therefore is not relative. Now if we begin from the humanist truth, the view of truth rather, they don't have truth, all it ends with is uh, a matter of statistical averages and then it leads to the place where humanism has brought us in our own generation. Here is one example of uh, this dilemma. Fouquet's Red Virgin. Fouquet's model was Agnes Sorel, who was the mistress of Charles VII, King of France. Was this the Madonna about to feed her baby? No. It might have had the title, The Red Virgin, but those who looked at the painting at that time knew who the woman was. She was the king's mistress. 
prior to this, Mary was considered high and holy. Even earlier, she was thought of as so different from normal people that she was painted merely as a symbol. Painting Mary as a real person was an advance over the earlier paintings because the Bible tells us that Mary was a real girl and the baby Jesus was a real baby. This was the good side. Nature was given its proper place. On the other hand, the king's mistress could now be painted as Mary and meaning was being destroyed. At first, it might seem that only religious values were being threatened, but gradually the threat spread to all of knowledge and all of life. All meaning for all the individual things, the particulars, was removed. The individual things were made independent, autonomous, with nothing ultimately to relate them to, to give them meaning. We are now in the Academy in Florence, in a room given to Michelangelo. On either side, we see Michelangelo's statues called the captives. These used to be called unfinished statues, but now many scholars agree that they were left to say what Michelangelo wanted them to say. Man is tearing himself out of the rock. Mankind will be victorious. As one passes these statues, we come to the focal point of the room, the magnificent statue of David. Out of a flawed piece of marble, Michelangelo, with all his genius, carved his David. A piece of art with few equals in the world. But this isn't the biblical David, but rather the personification of the humanist ideal, the greatness of man. But toward the end of his life, there were signs that Michelangelo saw that humanism was not enough. There was and there is no man like David. It is thought that in the Pieta, in the cathedral in Florence, he put his own face on Nicodemus as he was bending over Christ. Humanistic pride seems lessened, if not absent. We now come to another great giant of the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci. He was the first modern mathematician, and he was a chemist, physicist, musician, architect, anatomist, botanist, mechanical engineer, and artist. He did studies of the human anatomy. Some could still be used in today's textbooks. He was the embodiment of the true Renaissance man. He could do almost everything and do it well. He designed war machines of savage atrocity. He designed the ball bearing. He 
Leonardo really understood the problem of modern man. In his genius, he anticipated where humanism would end. He understood that humanistic man, beginning only with individual things, that is the particulars, had no unity by which to give them meaning. He understood that beginning humanistically with mathematics, one is left with individual things. And having only individual things, one could never come to universals or to meaning. Instead, one is left with mechanics. And in this, he saw ahead to our own day, where even man is viewed as a machine. Then Leonardo thought that perhaps the painter, the sensitive man, could come to meaning. So he tried and tried to portray the soul. This is not a soul in the Christian sense. Rather, he was trying to capture visually the universals from the particulars he observed. He failed. We're back to Raphael's school of Athens. Aquinas' teaching led to man trying to be independent, autonomous, and this led to Renaissance humanism. Leonardo, in all his brilliance, felt the problem and struggled to find universals. Leonardo and all of humanism had been so sure that man beginning only from himself could solve every problem. Its cry was, I can do what I will, just give me till tomorrow. But in his old age, Leonardo in his brilliancy saw the coming defeat of humanism. As a man thinketh, so is he. And humanism had already begun to show its natural conclusion was pessimism. When Francis I, King of France, took Leonardo to France, we find Leonardo in despondency. Anybody who doesn't feel the beauty of the Renaissance as he walks through Florence, I feel is a poor man. And I love to go to Florence and walk through the museums and just walk through the streets. But on the other hand, one who only sees the beauty and the glory of the Renaissance, in which man was increasingly making himself autonomous, if you don't feel the weakness of this, you also don't understand the Renaissance. Humanism invariably ends in despair. If you begin with that which is finite, no matter how far you project it, you can never come to an absolute. Never. In the light of the humanist dilemma, there is only one real solution, to turn to this book as truth, turn to the Bible, not just as an abstract religious thing, but as truth. It doesn't change. It speaks to the culture of that particular day. It's never old fashioned. It speaks to the most current topics, and yet it is always rooted in the same thing, the existence of this infinite personal God, and his having spoken, and then, of course, for man's personal need in the death of Christ for him.
Reformation, of course, is a technical term, uh, which means the breaking away of the reformers uh, from the uh, church as it had grown up in the Middle Ages, which we call the uh, Roman Catholic Church. And really what the Reformation was, to understand, uh, was the uh, turning away from the humanistic elements that had entered into the church during the time of the Middle Ages. This is no ordinary indulgence. This will build St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. And you will share in every mass that is said from now till doomsday. Our Lord Jesus Christ, by coming on earth, by suffering and dying, has already paid for our salvation forever. How then can any mortal man, monk, prince, or pope extort a further payment? In matters of faith, I think that neither council, nor pope, nor any man has power over my conscience. And where they disagree with scripture, I deny pope and council and all. A simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. Just as the high renaissance was coming to its close <clears throat> in the south of Europe, the Reformation exploded in the north of Europe. Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis to the church door in Wittenberg. Zwingli led Zurich in its break with the Church of Rome. A little later, England broke with the Church of Rome. John Calvin, the Geneva reformer, wrote his institutes. Martin Luther translated the Bible into German. This broke the ground for translations in other languages so the people could read the Bible for themselves for the first time. The Bible showed them that individual people could come directly to God by faith upon the basis of the finished work of Christ. It was grace only. Previously, as people entered into these churches, they were shut away from that which was the center of their worship, the altar which was here in the chancel, by a high screen of wood or of iron. During the Reformation, these were often removed. This one ran along up there. And then the Bible was placed directly where the screen had been in order to show that the teaching of the Bible opened the way for all people to come to God directly. In an earlier age, some of the Christians had cut down the sacred groves under which the pagan gods were worshiped. They didn't do this because they despised trees, but because of the particular religious significance of these trees as a sacred grove. In the same way in the Reformation, some of the men, the women of the Reformation, sometimes even the donors of the images themselves, destroyed some of the statues and pictures of the saints and the Madonnas. We might wish at this day that they had taken them and put them in a warehouse for 100 years or so. And then they could have been taken out and put into a museum. But at that moment of history, that would have been too much to ask. To the men and women of the Reformation, these were not objects of art. They were images to worship, obstacles that had come between them and God. They had discovered the biblical stress that there's only one mediator, Christ Jesus. And these images had come to represent to them 
that which they had religiously rejected. What had they rejected? First, that the church had made its authority equal to the authority of the Bible. There is only one proper interpretation of scripture, that which the church has established. What if scripture were in the hands of common man? for every potboy and swineherd to read in his own language and interpret for himself. What then? Why, then we might have more Christians, Father. Second, that the church had added human works that needed to be done to the finished work of Christ for salvation. For who would see his mother in flames when, with a piece of silver, he can set her free? For as soon as the money clinks in the chest, the soul flies up to heavenly rest. Come along, good people. And thirdly, since the time of Thomas Aquinas, increasingly the church had mixed biblical thinking and pagan thought. You remember that to Thomas Aquinas, the will was fallen, but the mind was not. This thinking gradually led to the high renaissance of the South, which was based on a humanistic ideal. Man had made himself the center and measure of all things. The mixture of biblical teaching and pagan thought showed itself in a number of ways. Raphael, for example, balanced his school of Athens. Here Plato, Aristotle, with his pictorial representation of the church on the opposite wall. It is called the Disputa, for it deals with the nature of the mass. Or Michelangelo, here in the Sistine Chapel, making the pagan prophetesses equal to the Old Testament prophets. William Farrell, the early French reformer, preached in this church. Here he is holding the Bible aloft. For Pharaoh and the other reformers, it was the scriptures only. When Erasmus of Rotterdam advocated a merely moderate reform of the church, Pharaoh spoke out and made it plain that he stood on principle against humanism from both sides. The humanism of the Renaissance and the Christian humanism, so-called, of Erasmus. Erasmus did make a contribution to the Reformation in his editing the New Testament in the original Greek and he urged that it be translated into all languages. But his Christian humanism was less than consistent Christianity, and Farrell spoke out against it. People needed the answers given by God in the Bible in order to know how to be right with God. But they also needed God's answers concerning the meaning of life and what is right and what is wrong. They needed an existing God, but a God who had spoken in a way that could be understood. I think I've found the truth at last. And when I found it, it was as though the gates of heaven were opened to me. Romans 1.17. By faith man lives and is made righteous, not by what he does for himself, be it adoration of relics, singing of masses, pilgrimages to Rome, purchase of pardon for his sins, but by faith in what God has done for him already through his son. Dr. Martin, if you leave the Christian to live only by faith, what will you put in their place? Christ. Man only needs Jesus Christ. When God states in the Bible what he is like, people have truth about God. Because people are finite, that is, they're limited. They do not have exhaustive knowledge about God. What they have is truth about God. And from what God gives in the scriptures, they also have truth about morals and meaning and values.
the early church. And thus a new door was opened, not only in religious matters, but also in culture and in society. This music is the direct result of the Reformation culture, the biblical Christianity of that time. The composer is Johann Sebastian Bach. His work is certainly the consummation of those composers that came out of the Reformation. Look, here in his own handwriting, the abbreviation in Latin, to God alone be the glory. One must understand that the Reformation had many facets. Though the full results of the Reformation did not come overnight, but gradually, yet nevertheless from the very beginning, uh, the life forms began to change on the basis of the Reformation teaching. The government of the church by lay elders of the congregation opened the way for further democratic development. People, the Bible teaches, are made in the image of God. Therefore, they have dignity. In Reformation times, this meant that all the vocations of life had dignity. That of the honest merchant or housewife, as much as that of the king. On the other hand, the Bible says that man is fallen. He has revolted against God. This is how Reformation man had an explanation of greatness and dignity in man, and yet his cruelty. The men of that day did not live in a splintered world as modern man does. Art was an intimate part of life. The Reformation had a close relationship to culture. The painter, Lucas Cranach, was Martin Luther's friend. Here is Luther himself and his wife, both by Cranach. Luther and Cranach were even the godfathers of each other's children. On Friday before Whitsunday, in the year 1521, the news reached Antwerp that Martin Luther had so treacherously been captured. For when the herald of the Emperor Charles had been ordered to accompany him with the Imperial Guard, he had confidence in this. But after the herald had brought him... This comes from Albert Durer's diary. He did not mean it to be published. Actually, the news that Luther had been captured proved to be false. His life was in danger, but his friends had hit him. ...who was illumined by the Holy Spirit and professed the true Christian faith. And is he still alive, or have they murdered him? I do not know. In which case, he has suffered for the Christian truth. And should we have lost this man who has written more clearly than any other that has lived during the last 140 years, and to whom you have given such an evangelical spirit. We pray you, O Heavenly Father. Durer is clearly a man of the Reformation as we examine the diary which he wrote at the time when Martin Luther was thought to have been killed. And in it, he indicates very thoroughly uh, that he was looking back to the pre-Reformation people. And these people would be 
Huss and Wycliffe. Huss had a tremendous influence in Germany at that time. And Durer makes very, very plain in his diary uh, that he's looking to these men and that his work flows from it. And as a matter of fact, if you examine his great works on the apocalypse, for example, which were done before the 95 Thesis of Luther, were nailed to the church door, one finds this strong biblical interplay actually in his work itself between his view of the Bible and the artworks which he produced. The marks of a man's creativity show his worldview. His worldview almost always shows through. And the art which flowed from the Reformation shows it the good marks of its biblical base. To Durer, God's world had value, real value, but not value in itself. It was a creation of God. Much art flowed from the Reformation culture. For example, the raising of the cross by Rembrandt. Here, Rembrandt painted himself, wearing his painter's beret. He raised Christ upon the cross, stating for all the world to see that his sins had sent Christ to the cross. His works show that he was a man of the Reformation. Nature was neither low nor was it to be idealized. It was a thing to be enjoyed as a creation of God. Here's Rembrandt's wife waiting for him. There is love and gentleness here. Rembrandt understood that Christ is the Lord of all of life. From what we have seen, it is clear that to say that the Reformation depreciated art and culture or that it did not produce art and culture is either total nonsense or dishonest. The Reformation had a strong place for culture both theoretically uh, and also in practice. Theoretically, because these people, if one examines the Dutch thinkers, for example, really believed in the um, lordship of Christ over the whole of life. And they saw nature as something wonderful, the leaves, the flowers, something beautiful, because it was God's universe. The practical side, of course, is that it simply brought forth culture. It just flowed forth in rivers. Dutch Reformation painting is one of the high points of painting in the whole world. These things are coming forth as a gift of God, and especially in the area of music, as far as Luther himself was concerned. This book contains the psalm set to music. It came out of Geneva. Some people thought they were so lively that in derision, they called them Geneva jigs. Martin Luther himself was a very fine musician. He had a good tenor voice, and as an instrumentalist, he performed with skill and verve. When his choir master, Johann Walter, put out the Wittenberg the songbook. Luther himself wrote in the preface. I am not of the opinion that all the arts shall be crushed to earth and perish through the gospel, as some bigoted persons pretend, but would willingly see them all, and especially music, servants of him who gave and created them. Just as the screen which separated the congregation from the altar was removed because the open Bible gave the people a direct access to God. So also the congregation 
was allowed to approach God directly by singing for the first time in many centuries. Luther himself wrote the words to this song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. to a certain point in the development of the Renaissance, it could have gone in a good direction or a poor one. Freedom was introduced both in the North by the Reformation and in the South by the Renaissance. But in the South, it brought forth license. The reason was that the humanism of the Renaissance had no way to bring forth meaning for the individual things, uh, for the particulars, nor absolutes in the area of morals. Humanism, which began with man being central, eventually has no meaning for man. But in the North, the men of the Reformation, standing under the scripture, regained direction. And the totality of life, as well as nature, became a thing of beauty and dignity. Man was given a reason for being great. And he was given a reason for freedom. And yet, compelling absolute values. Or it can be said this way. The humanistic elements of the Renaissance centered in autonomous man. The Reformation centered in the infinite personal God who had not been silent, but who had spoken in the Bible. Unless you can convince me by scripture, I am bound to my beliefs by the texts of the Bible. My conscience is captive to the word of God. Here I stand. do no other. God help me. Amen. When we begin to speak of the results of the Reformation, it did bring tremendous freedom. And we must always say both things together. The first thing and the primary thing is it suddenly gave freedom from having to work one way, work one's way to God. No longer was it necessary to merit the merit of Christ. One must understand the terrible psychological slavery because if you beat yourself 100 times in order to merit the merit of Christ, how do you know that you don't have to beat yourself 101 or 102? So the terrible slavery. So suddenly when we come to the gospel, the good news, that Christ has done it all and we accept this with the empty hands of faith, we have tremendous freedom from this awful, awful bondage that I've spoken of. But it brings many other freedoms because it is a terrible bondage really as a man, as a finite man, to have to act as God and make our own absolutes or try to because we really can't. And this is a bondage. And suddenly when we have in the Bible itself uh, that which gives us the absolutes, we are free then to function, whether in the area of science or morals or sociological things, or behavior patterns. We're free to operate within the circle that the absolutes of the scripture gives us.
We are in the old Supreme Court building of Switzerland in Lausanne. This painting was done in 1905 by Paul Robert. The judges had to pass it each time they came up to try a case to remind them of something. The Bible gives a basis not only for morals, but for law. How shall the judges judge? How indeed? So that the judgment would not be arbitrary. Justice here is not blindfolded. And her sword does not point upward, but down to this book, La Loi de Dieu, the law of God. This was the sociological and legal base for law in Northern Europe after the Reformation. As the Reformation emphasis that the Bible is the only final authority took root, the ordinary citizen was increasingly freed from arbitrary governmental power. What Paul Robert painted for the justices in the Supreme Court building in Lausanne, Samuel Rutherford of Scotland put down in writing in 1644. It provided the people with a base for effective political control of their sovereign. Lex Rex, law is king. Freedom without chaos, because there is form. Or, said in another way, a concept of law rather than the arbitrary governments of men. Because the Bible was there as the final authority, as a base. Samuel Rutherford's work and the tradition it embodied had a great influence on the American Constitution. Even though modern Americans have largely forgotten him and his influence. John Witherspoon, president of Princeton University, member of the Continental Congress, and one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, followed Samuel Rutherford's Lex Rex directly. Thomas Jefferson picked up this Christian teaching in secularized form from John Locke, the English philosopher who stressed inalienable rights, government by consent, separation of powers, the right of revolution. Locke did not have Samuel Rutherford's Christian base, but he built on this base and secularized it. So one must say that not all men who laid down the foundation for the United States were individually Christian. For example, Thomas Jefferson. However, he lived within the circle of what the Christian consensus brings forth. Many of the men who framed the United States Constitution were not individually Christians, but what they built rested on the Reformation through the Rex Lex tradition. On the basis of the Bible, as the final and unique authority, it's possible for a society and government to know form and freedom to the extent to which that society allows the biblical teaching to come to its natural conclusions. This is the Reformation wall in Geneva, a monument to the leaders of the Reformation. The Reformation in Northern Europe also gave a strong impetus toward the system of checks and balances in government. The men of the Reformation strongly emphasized the fall of man as man revolted against God. They were not romantic about man. They understood that every man is a sinner, so there needed to be checks and balances, especially for men in power. Calvin himself by no means had the authority often attributed to him, either in political or church affairs. His influence was moral and informal, as opposed to formalized or institutional authority. There had to be checks and balances. In each of the Reformation countries, this took slightly different forms. Switzerland was especially interesting in this regard. The Swiss have geographically separated their branches of government. The legislative and executive arms of the government are in Bern and the judiciary is in Lausanne. In Great Britain, there are the checks and balances of the king, the two houses of parliament, and the courts. In the United States, there is a slightly different arrangement, but the same basic principle. 
the White House as the executive administration. Congress, in two balanced parts, covers the legislative, and the Supreme Court embodies the judiciary. In the Reformation countries, there was a solution to the problem of form or chaos in society. In countries without this base, there was a more or less bloody conflict to try to resolve the tension between unmitigated power and privilege and the relatively powerless and underprivileged social groups. The Reformation was not perfect. It was no golden age. But in the Reformation countries, the situation was overwhelmingly better. And in the area of social relationships, these countries are still drawing upon this capital today. The French philosopher Voltaire, often called the father of the Enlightenment, and in whose chateau we are here, wrote these words after his years of exile in England. The English are the only people upon earth who have been able to prescribe limits to the power of kings by resisting them, and who, by a series of struggles, have at last established that wise government where the prince is all-powerful to do good and at the same time is restrained from committing evil and where the people share in the government without confusion. As you can see in the area of political reform, the results of the Reformation are very impressive. The British have been able to control the monarchy with indefinite legal bounds and to do this deliberately. The historians call this the Bloodless Revolution of 1688. During Voltaire's English exile, he was greatly impressed by the Bloodless Revolution of 1688 in England. But when the French Revolution tried to produce English conditions, but without the Reformation base, which gave freedom without chaos, using Voltaire's humanist enlightenment base, the result was a bloodbath and a rapid breakdown to the authoritarian rule of Napoleon. The National Assembly of France swore to establish a constitution in June 1789. This was the first phase of the liberal bourgeois plan for the French Revolution. And in August, they issued the Declaration of the Rights of Man. It sounds fine, but it had nothing to rest upon. Voltaire and the other men in the Enlightenment had no base but their own finiteness. What was called the supreme being equaled the sovereignty of the nation, the general will of the people. What a tremendous contrast to the English bloodless revolution. And what a contrast to the results of the Declaration of the Independence in America 13 years prior to the French Revolution. The English Bloodless Revolution and the American Declaration of Independence had a Reformation base. The French Declaration of the Rights of Man did not. It took the French National Constituent Assembly two years to write a constitution. Within two years, it was a dead letter. And now the second French Revolution was in motion. In order to make their base completely clear, rather than counting the years from the birth of Christ, they devised their own revolutionary calendar, in which 1792 uh, was the year one. They began to destroy the things of the past, even suggesting the destruction of the Cathedral of Chartres. They proclaimed the goddess of reason in Notre Dame in Paris and other churches in France, including Chartres. In Paris, the goddess they carried shoulder high was a certain damoiselle Candy from the opera. They did this to indicate as graphically as possible that human reason was being made supreme and that Christianity was being pushed aside. Before it was all over, 40,000 people 
many of them peasants, were killed by the government and its agents. Robespierre, the revolutionary leader, was himself executed. These results were not from outside. They were the product of the humanist Enlightenment base. The men of the Enlightenment thought that both man and society were perfectible. They held on to this even in the midst of the terror. Just as in the later Russian Revolution, there was no choice given the humanist base except anarchy or repression. Sometimes the French Revolution is related to the slightly earlier American Revolution, but in reality, this is incorrect. The American Revolution is related to the English Bloodless Revolution. And on the other hand, in contrast, what we find is that the French Revolution is very much related to the Russian Revolution. And then by 1799, Napoleon had arrived to govern as a one-man elite, just as Lenin later did in Russia. Allowing for local influences, it would seem that most of the revolutionary changes which came in the south of Europe, came by copying those changes that the Reformation brought forth in the area of freedom in the north of Europe, even though they contorted them in certain places. And when we think of the Reformation and what it brought forth in northern Europe by natural growth, and when even we think of what was brought forth by borrowing in the south of Europe, it stands in gigantic contrast to that which communistic countries have produced and continue to produce. Marxist, Leninist, communists have a great liability in arguing their case because they have never come to power and continued in power without their materialistic base leading to repression. Don't forget, it was not Lenin, Trotsky, Marx, and Stalin that made the break for freedom in Russia. The break was made with Prince George Levov as Prime Minister, and then Alexander Kerensky, a social reformer, but not a Leninist, in the February Revolution. Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin took over this revolution made by others in October of 1917 and built a regime of repression from the beginning. The Bolsheviks Leninists were only a very small percentage of the Russian people and made up only one quarter the Constituent Assembly. But when the Constituent Assembly, only just elected in November, met for the first time in January of the following year, 1918, the Bolsheviks dispersed it by force. The election of the Constituent Assembly was the first and the last free election in Russia. Repression engulfed not only political life and political freedom, but the whole spectrum of life. What was called the temporary dictatorship of the proletariat has proven to be in reality the permanent dictatorship of the small elite. Communism has to function on the basis of internal repression. One can think, for example, of the repression under Lenin, the Stalinist purges, the Berlin Wall, the loss of freedom in China. Russia also holds on to its allies by repression. Czechoslovakia, the repression did not end with the tanks. Later, half a million followers of Ducek were purged from the Communist Party. The Communist base has not produced anywhere the freedoms brought forth in Northern Europe by the Reformation. <laughs> it 
seeing the contrast to the southern European countries and to the communist countries, the riches provided by the Reformation in the area of society and government should not be minimized. And even in those places where the consensus produced by the Reformation people were less, was less consistent than it should have been, nevertheless, the biblical basis did give absolutes upon which to combat injustice. In contrast, the humanist has no way to say that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. Because for the humanist, the final thing that exists is the impersonal universe. And that's silent and neutral about right and wrong and about cruelty and non-cruelty. He has no way to have absolutes. Therefore, consistent with its own position, humanism, both in private life and private morals and in political life, is left only with the arbitrary. And because there was no basis for right and wrong, laws could be exchanged tomorrow for another arbitrary absolute for the sake of expediency. We have just seen what happened in those countries which did not have biblical absolutes, which did not have a Reformation base. But we must not forget that as the centuries passed, weaknesses did develop in those countries which did have a Reformation history. People often did not act consistently upon the biblical teaching which they said they held. And today's Christians must feel profoundly sorry uh, for these places of inconsistency uh, when biblical Christianity had more influence upon society than it has today. And of course, the most effective apology is for today's Christians to act more consistently upon the biblical teaching at these crucial points. There were various areas where the Bible was not followed <clears throat> as it should have been, but two stand out glaringly. First, a twisted view of race, and second, a non-compassionate use of accumulated wealth. A twisted view of race took two forms, slavery based upon race and race prejudice as such. Slavery based upon race was, of course, the most blatant, and race prejudice continues right down to our own day. Arab slave traders, such as those seen in this drawing, captured the Africans whom they then sold into slavery. Many Englishmen, Europeans and Americans indulged in the arbitrary fiction that the black man was not a person and could therefore be treated as a thing. Here the United States must bear special criticism as slavery based on race continued to such a late date. We just cannot pass over the conditions that existed on these slave ships in which thousands died crossing the seas and the treatment these slaves often received. Slavery based upon race and racial prejudice are wrong. We must acknowledge that often both were present when Christians had much more influence on the consensus than they have today. And the church as such did not speak out sufficiently. The beginning of the industrial age was the harnessing of water power in new ways. After water, steam was harnessed. This coal burning steamer, which we are on, is a relic of the industrial revolution. belong to the inventors and the engineers. Industrialization produced a steady stream of better things, for example, better pottery for the working man's table. 
and a steady flow of more goods for everyone. If industrialization had been accompanied by a compassionate use of accumulated wealth and an emphasis on the dignity of each individual man, both of which are stressed in the Old and the New Testaments, the Industrial Revolution would have been a revolution for good indeed. But unhappily, there was too often silence on these two crucial points. There were acts of individual charity, help to the poor. But the church often was simply silent on the Bible's command for the compassionate use of wealth, both in England and in other countries. It wasn't that most people were worse off than in the previous mostly agrarian society, but that the wealth the Industrial Revolution produced was often not used with compassion. Thus slums grew in London and the industrial towns. The average working day was between 12 and 16 hours. Women and children were especially exploited. The central reason the church should have spoken on these issues with courage and clarity is that the Bible commands it. If the church has spoken out clearly against the cruel use of wealth as a kind of a survival of the fittest, probably this concept would not have been so automatically accepted when it was put forth by a secularized science. All too often, the church did not speak out clearly against utilitarianism, a teaching that the measure of all ethical questions is that which is useful. To keep the matter in balance, it must be said that there were many non-Christian forces at work, and also that many who would have called themselves Christians were not Christians at all in the biblical sense. It was fashionable uh, to bear the name uh, and to go through the forms. It was the church as the church that did not take a clear and vocal stand when it had the voice to do so. Individually, there were many Christians who fought for the truly Christian teaching which should accompany a Christian consensus and had a vital and vocal part in the battle against these abuses. The Bible makes plain that there should be a result in these areas from the preaching of the gospel. There were many voices raised and lives given to illustrate it. John Wesley spoke out strongly against slavery, including slavery in the United States. John Newton was a slave trader. He became a Christian, and he quit the trade and spoke out against it. Thomas Clarkson spoke out strongly against slavery, and William Wilberforce, following the pioneer work of Clarkson, fought on and on against slavery and for the basic recognition of the humanity of the black man under God. Wilberforce the Christian, and because he was a Christian, was the overwhelmingly outstanding voice in England against the slave trade. The slave trade was prohibited in England in 1807, and as Wilberforce lay dying in 1833, slavery itself was abolished in England. I wish there had been someone in the United States as consistent to Christian principles as early as 1833 and as influential as Wilberforce, someone who could have brought forth the same results in the United States. In Britain, John Howard, friend of John Wesley, labored tirelessly for prison reform. Elizabeth Fry, a Quaker, had a profound and practical compassion for the prisoners of Newgate Prison. Lord Shaftesbury, as a Christian, fought on and on against the exploitation of children in the factories. The preaching of George Whitfield and John Wesley revived biblical Christianity in Britain. This had a strong impact on the grassroots, which inspired 
political education and economic reform. As a matter of fact, it is not too strong to say that without this influence, England could not have escaped its own version of the French Revolution. The Reformation did not bring about perfection, but gradually on the basis of its return to its biblical teaching, it did bring forth a unique improvement, a vast and tremendous freedom in society without chaos. The biblical absolutes provided a basis for a consensus of values. And within this, there could be this tremendous freedom without these freedoms leading to chaos. The biblical teaching meant that there was something by which the society and the state could be judged, namely the biblical absolutes. The little man, the ordinary citizen, with a Bible in his hand could jump up and say that the majority was wrong. So, to the extent in which the biblical teachings were practiced, the despotism of the 51% vote, the despotism of an individual, or the despotism of a group could be controlled. The basis by which there could be this tremendous freedom without chaos is the fact that the Bible gives a base for law. In 1609, Galileo began to use the telescope, a newly invented instrument. And what he saw and wrote indicated that Aristotle had been mistaken in his basic ideas concerning the makeup of the universe. When the Roman church attacked Galileo and Copernicus, it was not because their teaching contained anything contrary to the Bible. But Copernicus and Galileo's teaching did deny the Aristotelian elements which had become a part of the teaching of the church. Copernicus taught that the earth went around the sun and not the sun around the earth. And Galileo defended the compatibility of Copernicus and the Bible. Condemned by the Roman Inquisition in 1632, Galileo was forced to back down. But his writings continue to testify not only that Copernicus was right, but that Aristotle was wrong. Blaise Pascal took a tube of mercury up a mountain. 
and measured the changes in the mercury levels according to the altitude. In this way, he made the first successful barometer. Not only that, but some consider that he's the greatest writer of French prose who has ever lived. He did not see man lost like a speck of dust in the universe, which was so much larger and more complicated than men had thought. For man could comprehend the stars. The stars comprehended nothing. And beside this, for Pascal, man was special because Christ had died on the cross for him. What I have in my hand is not the proverbial apple that supposedly fell on Newton's head. What I have is a heavier object which would have knocked him out. As I take away my hand, it will fall to the ground. But listen, what was that second noise? Listen again. What you heard, of course, was an echo. Here at Cambridge University, Newton worked out the speed of sound by timing the interval of an echo over a known distance. He also came to the conclusion that there was a universal force of attraction between every body in the universe. He called this gravity. Newton's mathematical principles of natural philosophy became one of the most influential books in the history of human thought. It has been said that the 17th century scientists had an interest in the how, but not the why. Not true. For Newton and many scientists of that period, there was no problem concerning the why, because Newton began with the existence of a personal God who had created the universe. Newton had an intense interest in the Bible, because in his view, the same God who had created the universe gave men truth in the Bible. Newton and the other men of that period would have been utterly astounded at anyone who had an obsession with the how uh, without having a professional interest in the why. Francis Bacon, lawyer, essayist, Lord Chancellor of England, stressed careful observation and systematic collection of information in order to unlock nature's secrets. He too took the Bible seriously, including the historic fall, the revolt of man in history. Man, by the fall, fell at the same time from his state of innocence and from his dominion over creation. Both of these losses, however, can, even in this life, be in some parts repaired the former by religion and faith, the latter by the arts and sciences. To these founders of modern science, man, including his science, is not on his own. He is to take seriously the teaching of the Bible concerning history and the cosmos. And yet, art and science in themselves have value before man and God. This gave a strong impetus to the creative movings of science, not to be merely a passing thing, um, but to be continuous. God himself had given benevolent dominion over nature to men, and for Bacon, science had a part in this. To find out about the world was worthwhile because of men investigating God's marvelous creation. To quote Bacon again, Let no man out of weak conceit of sobriety or an ill-applied moderation think or maintain that a man can search too far or be too well studied in the book of God's word or in the book of God's works. The book of God's word is, of course, the Bible. The book of God's works is the universe which God had made. There was no separation between religious things and the arts and science. The tradition of Bacon and Newton was strongly maintained right up through the 19th century. The experimental physicist Michael Faraday was a Christian. He believed the secrets of God's creation are for all of us to enjoy. So he gave his famous public demonstrations. 
The physical world is an open book to explore because God gave it order and gave us the desire to investigate it, not just for a clever scientific elite, no, for all men. Not all the early scientists were individually consistent Christians. Many were, but all of them were living within the thought forms brought forth by Christianity. In this setting, man's creative stirrings had a base from which to continue and to develop. Knowing that the universe had been created by a reasonable God, the scientists upon a Christian base were able to move out with confidence, expecting to be able to find out about the universe by observation and experiment. Without this base, this foundation, modern Western science would never have been born. Without this base, Chinese science, though it had promising beginnings, never came to maturity. There was no confidence that the code of nature's laws could be unveiled and read, because there was no assurance that a divine being, even more rational than ourselves, had ever formulated such a code capable of being read. And this was said by Joseph Needham, an expert on this subject. The same thing could be said about Arab science. Without a Christian base, they lost their interest in science eventually. The Christian base then did not hinder science. The Christian base made modern science possible. In 1962, J. Robert Oppenheimer said that modern science was born out of the Christian life form. His field was that of atomic energy. He was also director for the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton. Alfred North Whitehead, well-known mathematician and philosopher, said that Christianity was the mother of science. These views were held both by the pre-Reformation church and also in the teachings of the reformers. Both held that the universe was created by God and that God is a reasonable God, as the Bible says he is. But we may ask, isn't science now in a new state one in which the concept of an orderly universe is passe. It is often said that the worldview of relativity, that there are no absolute values and that everything is relative, is supported by Einstein's theory of relativity. But this is wrong. Einstein said uh, that light travels at a constant speed in a vacuum everywhere in the universe. Therefore, nothing is less relative uh, than the theory of relativity. Einstein himself was strongly opposed to this type of thinking. I cannot believe that God plays dice with the cosmos. We really do live in a cause and effect universe. If this space vehicle is to fly, it must be constructed according to the existing order of the universe. When something happens, no matter what we may say we believe, we look for something that happened previously as an explanation. If this were not possible, nothing could be explained, and science could not be applied with reliability. Because we live in a universe where cause produces effect, this space vehicle can fly thousands of miles and land exactly on target. You see, cause. The flight of the spacecraft is charted. Effect. It lands where it is supposed to. We know we live in a universe that is much more complex than men, including scientists, once thought it to be. But that is a far cry from the concept of a random universe. What view of the universe did Galileo, Newton, Faraday, and others who shared a Christian base have? They held that the universe was an open universe because God and man are not a part of an all-inclusive cosmic machine. There is something profound in this. The machine, whether it is the cosmic machine or a machine which men make, is not a master nor a threat because the machine does not include everything. There is a place for man to be man. 
Later, when the Christian base was lost, the mechanical laws of cause and effect, which had been applied to chemistry, to astronomy, and to physics, were now applied equally to man and to society. The earlier scientists, the founders of modern science, would not have accepted this concept. With it, immediately there was no place for God, but equally no place for man as man. Man died, and love died. There is no place for love in a totally closed cause and effect system. And there is no place for morals. And there is no place for the freedom of man. There is no place for the significance of man. Man becomes a zero. Life becomes pointless, devoid of meaning. The older idea of man as someone observing nature was undermined by the idea that man is something to be observed as no different from all of nature. Darwin, in his Origin of the Species, claimed that all life evolved from more simple forms through survival of the fittest. The concept of an unbroken line from the molecule to man merely on the basis of time and chance does not answer either of the two questions of the how or the why which occupied Newton and Bacon. Murray Eden, professor of MIT, has made statistical studies which indicate that pure chance could not have produced the biological complexity of the world out of chaos in any amount of time suggested so far. Scientific Research Magazine has discussed Murray Eden's work in an article entitled, Mathematicians Question Darwinism. Has there been enough time for natural selection as is seen through the eyepieces of Darwinism or Neo-Darwinism to operate and give rise to the observed phenomena of nature? No, say these mathematicians. No one has shown how man could have come from non-man on the basis of time and chance. Tragically, after one has accepted the concept of the survival of the fittest, all restraints are removed. This opened the door for 20th century racism to be sanctioned and made respectable in the name of science. When biblical Christianity ceased to provide the consensus for German society, when political and economic chaos, as well as moral permissiveness, prevailed, the stage was set for the Nazi movement. Heinrich Himmler, who was the head of the Gestapo, stated the law of nature must take its course in the survival of the fittest. Hitler stated numerous times that Christianity and its concept of charity should be replaced by the ethic of strength over weakness, the survival of the fittest. There were many factors in the rise of National Socialism in Germany, but in that setting, the evolutionary survival of the fittest concept sanctioned what occurred. Humanism had set out to make man autonomous, and it turned out poorly. In a quieter way, and yet importantly, some of today's advocates of genetic engineering use exactly the same arguments to put forth their position. They say that genetic engineering ought to be used for the survival of the fittest, rather than medical advances being used to keep the weak alive, to be the producers of the next generation. 
When the Christian consensus died, it left a vacuum. And this will tend to be filled by an elite to form an authoritarian state. When we speak of an authoritarian state, we must not think of the model of Hitler or Stalin, but rather a manipulative authoritarian state. The governments of the world have at their disposal forms of manipulation beyond anything the world has ever known before. Organ transplants are a helpful breakthrough, and we can be glad for it. But to get the needed kidneys and other organs for transplants, the surgeon naturally has to await the donor's death. The accepted definition of death used to be the cessation of heartbeat and breathing. Now the definition is a flat brain wave. This is not wrong in itself, but it opens the door to harvesting the dead. With the brain wave flat, these bodies could be kept alive indefinitely to harvest their blood, to harvest their organs, for transplants and for experimentation. Without the absolute line which Christianity gives of man being totally unique, things which are good in themselves can lead to an increasing loss of humanness. For modern man, there is no boundary line between what he should do and what he should not do. And this leaves him with what he can do. Any moral ought is only what is sociologically accepted at the moment. Now, as a Christian, I have a reference point in the Bible. I have a reference point by what it teaches. And in this way, I have something to judge things by. Uh, but on the other hand, if I am left without any fixed point by which to judge things, without any cubby holes, as it were, to fit the thoughts that are being thrown at me, I have no basis of judgment at all. I'm just left naked uh, before these things that are thrown at me uh, with no possible way of making a critical analysis. Many couples today cannot have children because of a low sperm count on the part of the husband. This can often be cured by artificial insemination using the husband's sperm. This is called AIH, H standing for the husband. This is surely a help to many couples. There then comes AID, sperm by a donor, another man. Where is the boundary line? Where does adultery begin? At present in Britain, such a child would be considered illegitimate. In the book, Our Future Inheritance, Choice or Chance, it is written, perhaps the most sensible suggestion made is that the concept of legitimacy be removed altogether. This is not only a change of morals, but a weakening of the family. They make this change upon the basis of what they call social hindrance. It is what I call sociological law. We would all be glad to see the genetic diseases cured. But once the borderlines are removed, which are based upon the biblical absolutes, then humanness can be and is lost increasingly, and increasingly Full genetic engineering is accepted, and so is control. It is B.F. Skinner's thesis that all the people are is the result of conditioning by society, and that through positive reinforcers, society should make people into what it wants them to be. George T. Harris in Psychology Today says, Nobody would panic at Skinner's attack upon our idea of freedom if he were only talking. But he has a program and followers to push it. Such behaviors are often found where it counts. At times, they control education in the schools down to the lowest grades. With all forms of determinism, man as man dies. The determinist has no way to derive his values from what exists, and hence his values and his morals must be chosen arbitrarily. Once this way of thinking is accepted, 
it is much easier to impose arbitrary absolutes. To quote B.F. Skinner, to man as man, we readily say, good riddance. I think we'd have to say, and it's not trite at all, though it's often been said, that science has become our new religion. Uh, we have been conditioned to accept the objectivity of the scientists without realizing that often their views are very clearly shaped uh, by their philosophy uh, or by their uh, worldview. And therefore, having accepted this objectivity almost blindly and having it driven into us, uh, whether it would be the more exact scientists, uh, sciences, uh, for instance, astronomy or chemistry or physics, or what uh, now is accepted as um, almost exact sciences of sociology and um, psychology, having been accepted, having been conditioned to accept these things, people just stop listening. They just take what they're told uh, without any critical analysis. It is well known that in Russia, political prisoners are put into mental institutions to be reconditioned, and thus they lose their civil rights and they become non-persons. But conditioning does not have to be so crude in order to be effective. In the West, the flood of books and articles and ideas about psychological, sociological, uh, and chemical determinism has opened the way for the acceptance of first the idea and then the practice of manipulation. People have been increasingly conditioned to be treated as machines and to treat other people as machines. And the technical breakthroughs have largely been made for manipulation. No less a person than Arthur Kessler, the noted scientist and author, has suggested that a chemical agent be developed to rid men of aggression and give him tranquility. In other words, a super tranquilizer. Just like those who wanted to put LSD into the water supply, he suggested that some community may put it in its drinking water so that everyone could get the effects of it. In this section, I'm giving that which has been reported in various newspapers and news magazines. Kenneth B. Clark, one time president of the American Psychological Association, suggested in 1971 that all political leaders should have to take anti-aggression pills so they could not be aggressive. And the head of the gynecology and obstetrics department of the Kansas City University Medical School, Dr. Kermit Cranty, urged that birth control pills be put into the world's drinking supplies to control population. And some have suggested that the state could dispense yet another drug to certain households to neutralize the pill. This way the state could decide who could have babies and who could not. Russell V. Lee, clinical professor emeritus of Stanford University Medical School said that all public officials should have to have uh, psychological annual testing in depth. And in the case of a high federal official, if the committee thinks it's necessary, the findings could be turned over to a congressional committee who would have the power to remove the official from office. One little thing, the men who dispense the pills and who do the psychological testing will be king. Who will control the controllers? And what will happen now that the line between what man should do and what he can do is obliterated? And if man is only a conditioned machine, what is the value of the continuation of mankind? The thing that made the difference between the view of the early scientists and that which marks man today, who sees man as being only a part of a cosmic machine, is not something science has demonstrated. It simply was a shift in the philosophic outlook of the scientists.
turning away from the early base that science had of the world having been created by a reasonable God. And the only way that we could return would be to go back to that which the early scientists believed, a God who exists and is not silent. And he's spoken in a way that people can understand in the Bible and in the revelation in Christ. And in the Bible and in the revelation of Christ, we have truth that gives us the key of the whole of life. It tells us the origin of the universe, why it has form. It tells us why man is great, is made in the image of God. It tells us why man is cruel, because he has turned away from God as his integration point and put himself at the center, the fall. It gives us all these things. And then, of course, it gives us also a basis in its absolute teaching uh, for both morals and law. The history of the non-Christian philosophers up until the 18th century went like this. Here is a circle which stands for what the unified and true knowledge of the universe is. Then the next man would say no and cross out the circle. But he then would say, here is the circle. And the next man would say no and cross out that circle. Then he would make his circle. And the next man would cross it out and make his circle. This continued through the centuries. They never found the circle, but they optimistically believed someone would beginning only for man himself and on the basis of man's reasoning alone. Then the endless row of circles through the centuries and the crossing out were broken. And a drastic shift came because the humanistic ideal had failed. Humanistic man gave up his optimism for pessimism. He gave up the hope of a unified answer. And this
all restraints of society. When Rousseau applied his concept of autonomous freedom to society, his concept would not function. Whosoever refuses to obey the general will shall be compelled to do so by the whole body. Rousseau wrote this in 1762. This means nothing less than that he will be forced to be free. In other words, tyranny, a tyranny that carried his position to its logical conclusion in the reign of terror of the French Revolution. Robespierre, the king of the terror, genuinely saw himself putting Rousseau's ideas into practice. Paul Gauguin was a follower of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. In his hunt for total freedom, he deserted his family. He went to Tahiti, hoping to find there the noble savage. And there he found the ideal of the noble savage to be an illusion. As he worked on this painting, he also wrote about it. He called it a philosophical work comparable to the gospel. But what a gospel. Gauguin himself said, Close to the death of an old woman, a strange, stupid bird concludes, Whence? What? Whither? O oh, sorrow, thou art my master. Fate, how cruel thou art and always vanquished, I revolt. What he found in Tahiti was death and cruelty. The man is good by nature, as Rousseau claimed, is no more true a primitive man than a civilized man. When Gauguin finished this painting, he tried to commit suicide, but he did not succeed. There was one man who well understood the logical conclusion of the deification of nature, the Marquis de Sade. If nature is all, then what is, is right, and nothing more can be said. As nature has made us, the men, the strongest we can do with her, the woman, whatever we please. The inevitable result was his cruelty to women. Thus, there was no basis for either morals or law. Let me dwell for a moment on the Dutch Reformation painters who so rejoicingly painted the simple things of life. They knew that nature was created by a personal and a good God. But they also knew, because of the fall, man's revolt against God, that nature as it is now is abnormal. That is a very different thing than taking nature as it is now and making it the measure of goodness. Because when this is done, there is no difference between cruelty and non-cruelty. Even at the time of Rousseau and his followers, the two concepts of total freedom and of everything including man being part of one big machine could no longer be kept together. Rousseau's position of man's total freedom collides with the position that on the basis of man's reason alone, everything including man is part of one big machine. The two positions just couldn't be kept united. Later, the German philosophers, Immanuel Kant and George Wilhelm Hegel, and the Danish Soren Kierkegaard, wrestled with the problem of a unity of reason on one hand, and on the other hand, meaning and values. But they did not solve the problem. Humanistic man, beginning only from himself, has concluded that he is only a machine.
humanistic man has no place for a personal God. But there is also no place for man's significance as man. No place for love. No place for freedom. Man is only a machine. But the men who hold this position could not and cannot live like machines. If they could, modern man would not have his tensions, either in his intellectual position or in his life. But he can. And so they must leap away from reason to try to find something which gives meaning to their lives, to life itself, even though to do so, they deny their reason. Once this is done, any type of thing could be put there. Because in the area of non-reason, reason gives no basis for a choice. This is the hallmark of modern man. How did it happen? It happened because proud, humanistic man, though he was finite, insisted in beginning only from himself and from what he could learn without other knowledge. He did not succeed. Perhaps the best known of the existential philosophers was John Paul Sartre. He used to spend much time here in Paris at the Durmago. His position is that in the area of reason, everything is absurd. But that one can authenticate himself, uh, that is, give validity to his existence by an act of the will. With Sartre's position, one can equally help an old woman across the street. Merci, monsieur. Oh, ben vous savez de nos jours, hein? Merci, monsieur. Merci beaucoup. Or run her down. Reason was not involved, and there was nothing to show the direction that this authentication by an act of the will should take. But Sartre himself could not live consistently with his own position. Addressé au président du tribunal international sur les crimes de guerre par le président Okimin. At a certain point, he signed the Algerian Manifesto, which declared that the Algerian war was a dirty war. This action meant man could use his reason to decide some things were right and some things were wrong, and so he destroyed his own system. Carl Jaspers, a German existentialist, tended to have the greatest impact on the thought and life form which followed existential thought. According to him, we may have some huge experience, which gives us the hope that perhaps there is a meaning to life, even though our reason tells us that life is absurd. He calls this a final experience. Martin Heidegger was another existential philosopher who said that the answer was in the area of non-reason. The German philosopher said there is something he called angst, a general feeling of anxiety one feels in the universe. This feeling, this mood of anxiety, revealed existence. And this imposes on us a call for decision. Out of this mood comes meaning to life and to choice, even against one's reason meaning which rests on nothing more than this vague feeling of anxiety so nebulous it doesn't even have a specific object as martin heidegger grew older this view became too weak for him so he changed his position existentialism as a form of philosophy has all but disappeared but more and more people are thinking this way even if they do not know the name existentialism. To them, reason leads to pessimism. And so they try to find an answer in something totally separated from reason. Aldous Huxley, the English philosopher and writer, proposed drugs as a solution. According to him, we should give drugs to healthy people. 
by means of the drug experience, they could then find truth inside their own heads any time they wished. What was left for Huxley and his followers was truth inside man's own head. To them, objective truth was gone. The drug culture and the mentality that went with it had its own vehicle which crossed the frontiers of the world which were otherwise almost impassable by other means of communication. This record became the rallying cry of many of the young people throughout the whole world. It expressed the essence of their lives, their thoughts, and their feelings. Later came psychedelic rock, an attempt to find this experience without drugs. The younger people and the older ones tried drug taking, but then turned to the Eastern religions. Both drugs and the Eastern religions seek truth inside one's own head, in negation of reason. The central reason for the popularity of Eastern religions in the West is a hope for non-rational meaning to life and values. The reason young people uh, turn to the Eastern religions and so on is, is simply the fact, uh, as we have said, and that is that man having moved into the area of non-reason, you can put anything up there. And the heart of the Eastern religion is a denial of reason, uh, just exactly as the idealistic drug taking was. And so the turning to the Eastern religions today fits exactly into the modern existential methodology, the existential thinking of modern man, of trying to find some optimistic hope in the area of non-reason when he's given up hope on a humanistic basis of finding any kind of unifying answer to life, any meaning to life in the answer of reason. Though demons do not fit into modern man's conclusions on the basis of his reason, many modern people feel that even demons are better than everything in the universe being only one big machine. People put the occult in the area of non-reason in the hope of some kind of meaning, even if it is a horrendous kind of meaning. One must feel as a Christian a real sorrow for these people. But as far as the blame is concerned, we must understand these people who have turned to this are not to blame. They must bear their own kind of blame of individual choices. But basically, they're not to blame. The church is to blame because the church, with its liberal theology, has left a vacuum. Man, beginning from himself alone, was now expressed and taught in theology and in theological language. In the Renaissance, men had attempted to mix Aristotle and Plato with Christianity. This new theology was an attempt to combine the rationalism of the Enlightenment with Christianity. It is often called religious liberalism. It was embarrassed by the supernatural and often denied it entirely. For example, the resurrection of Christ from the dead. But it tried to hold on to a historical Jesus by sifting out from the New Testament all those supernatural elements which the New Testament taught about Jesus. This attempt came to a climax with Albert Schweitzer's famous book, Quest of the Historical Jesus.
Organism in Africa, his genius as an organist, and his expertise concerning Bach. But unhappily, we must remember his place in the theological stream as well. After the failure of the older theological liberalism, Karl Barth stepped into the vacuum. He held the higher critical views concerning the Bible. That is that the Bible has many mistakes. But he taught that a religious word could break through from it. This was the theological form of existentialism after existentialism had been accepted in its secular form. Thus, one more thing was added to the area of non-reason, along with the, all the other things that had been put there. In another way, we must have admiration for the Swiss Karl Barth, because while he was teaching in Germany, he spoke out clearly against Nazism in his Barman Declaration of 1934. The teaching of Barth led to those theologians who said that the Bible isn't true in the areas of science and history. But they nevertheless looked for a religious experience from it. And for many adherents of this theology, the Bible does not give absolutes in regard to what is right or wrong either. Before you even come to the Bible and begin to read it, one must realize there are two ways to read the Bible. One is just one more religious thing among thousands of other religious things, which really are nothing more than another form of trip, not very, very different, actually, from a drug trip. The other way is to understand that the Bible is truth. And as such, what we're listening to is something that is completely contrary to what we hear about us on every side, namely merely statistical averages, relativist, relativistic things. Now, having said this, then I'd have to guard myself for the simple reason that it doesn't mean a person has to believe all this before he can begin to read the Bible and find truth in the Bible. I would just say in passing, I was not raised in a Christian family, and uh, I was reading much philosophy when I was a young man, and I didn't read the Bible because I believed it was true. I read it uh, just simply out of an intellectual honesty. But I did do one thing. I read it exactly the way it was written. Beginning with Genesis 1-1 and going right on, I read it the same way I would read another book, expecting that what was being given uh, was a straightforward statement of what was meant, and that it wasn't to be read in a, in a, in a different level than I would read in the area of, a, of another kind of book. And as I read it, it answered the questions, uh, which already by that time I realized that humanistic philosophy couldn't answer. And over a six-month period, I came to conclude that it was truth. But nevertheless, we must keep in the back of our mind, how are we reading the Bible? Just as another religious trip? Or am I really wrestling with the question of what is given in all the areas of which it speaks? Is this truth in compared to merely relativism? The new liberal theologian has no answer for the existence of evil. And thus they're left with the same problem as the Hindu philosophers. Everything that is, is a part of God. This is Kali the Eastern Hindu feminine representation of God. Why the fangs and the skulls? In Eastern religious thought, cruelty is ultimately the same as non-cruelty, because everything that now is, is part of that which has always been, a part of what they call God. Modern humanistic man has come to the same awful place, and place in which it is not possible to know what is right and what is wrong, nor why we should choose non-cruelty rather than cruelty. Professor Paul Tillich of Harvard was one of the outstanding neo-Orthodox liberal theologians. A student who was present told me that when Professor Tillich was lecturing in Santa Barbara just before his death, someone said to him, sir, do you pray? And he said, no, but I meditate. He was left only with the word God, with no certainty that there was anything more than just a word. The God is dead theologians, which followed Tillich, concluded logically 
that if they are only left with the word God, they might as well cross out the word. But for these theologians, even if they do not say God is dead, for them certain things are dead. All content about God is dead, and all assurance of knowledge about a personal God is dead. Because for them, God has not given to people truth about himself in the Bible and in the revelation in Christ. That is, truth about himself which may be expressed in propositions in normal language. All they're left with is religious words without content, but with that emotion that certain religious words still brings with them, and that is all. And here is what comes next. These highly motivational religious words out of our religious past, but separated from the content which the Bible originally gave them, are now used for manipulation. Manipulation in such areas as a change in sexual ethic, but also legal and political manipulation. If God is dead, if content about God is dead, if the knowledge of a personal God who has not been silent but has given us truth is dead, then everything for which God gives an answer and meaning is dead as well. And yet, people, no matter who they say they are, cry out for meaning and values. And this place of tension is where modern man has come upon his humanist base. And this is where he is. When we think of Christ, of course, we think of his substitutionary death upon the cross. When he who claimed to be God died in a substitutionary way. And as such, his death had infinite value. And as we accept that gift, raising the empty hands of faith and accepting it with no humanistic elements, uh, we have that which is real life, and that is in being in relationship uh, to the infinite personal God who is there, and, and being in a personal relationship to him. But Christ brings life in another way that often is not as clearly thought about, perhaps, and that is that he connects himself with what the Bible teaches in his teaching. And as such, he is a prophet as well as a savior. And it's upon the basis of what he taught and the Bible teaches, because he himself wraps these together, uh, that we have life instead of death in the sense of having some knowledge that is more uh, than man can have from himself, beginning from himself alone. Both of these elements are the place where Christ gives us life.
Monet, Renoir, Pissarro, Sisley, and Degas were following nature, as it was then called, in their painting. They were impressionists. They painted only what their eyes brought them. But was there reality behind the light waves reaching their eyes? After 1885, Monet carried this to its conclusion, and reality tended to become a dream. With Impressionism, the door was open for art to become the vehicle for modern thought. As reality became a dream, Impressionism began to fall apart. These men, Cezanne, Van Gogh, Gauguin, Seurat, all great post-Impressionists felt the problem, felt the loss of meaning. They set out to solve the problem, to find the way back to the reality, to the absolute, behind the individual things, behind the particulars. Ultimately, they failed. I am not saying that these painters were always consciously painting their philosophy of life, but rather that in their work as a whole, their worldview was often reflected. Cezanne reduced nature to what he considered its basic geometric forms. In this, he was searching for a universal which would tie all kinds of individual things in nature together. But this gave a broken, fragmented appearance to his pictures. In his bathers, there is much freshness, much vitality, an absolute wonder in the balance of the picture as a whole. But he portrayed not only nature, but man himself in fragmented form. I want to stress that I am not minimizing these men as men. To read Van Gogh's letters is to weep for the pain of this sensitive man. Nor do I minimize their talent as painters. Their work often has great beauty indeed. But their art did become the vehicle of modern man's view of fractured truth and life. As philosophy had moved from unity to fragmentation, so did painting. In 1912, Kandinsky wrote an article saying that insofar as the old harmony, that is, a unity of knowledge, had been lost, that only two possibilities remained, extreme abstraction or extreme naturalism. Both, he said, were equal. With this painting, modern art was born. Picasso painted it in 1907 and called it Les Damoiselles d'Avignon. It unites Cezanne's fragmentation with Gauguin's concept of the noble savage using the form of the African mask, which was popular with the Parisian art circle of that time. In great art, technique is united uh, with worldview. And the technique of fragmentation fits well with the worldview of modern man. A view of a fragmented world and fragmented man, and a complete break with the art of the Renaissance, which was founded on man's humanist hopes. Here, man is made to be less than man. Humanity is lost. Speaking of a part of Picasso's private collection of his own works, David Douglas Duncan says, of course, not one of these pictures was actually a portrait, but his prophecy of a ruined world. But Picasso himself could not live with this loss of the human. When he was in love with Olga and later Jacqueline, he did not consistently paint them in a fragmented way. At crucial points of their relationship, he painted them as they really were, with all his genius, with all their humanity. When he was painting his own young children, he did not use fragmented techniques and presentation. I want you to understand that I am not saying that gentleness and humanness are never present in modern art. But as the techniques of modern art advanced, humanity was increasingly fragmented. The opposite of fragmentation would be unity. 
and the old philosophic thinkers thought they could bring forth this unity from a humanist base. And then they gave this up. And the modern thinking has accepted fragmentation as a defeat, really, a defeat that human uh, mentality beginning from itself can bring forth a unity uh, of thought and of life. Now, by unity, what we mean is that which would include all of thought and all of life. And it can be achieved if indeed God has spoken and has not been silent. And in giving is the facts that man couldn't find for himself. There is a unity inside of which all that marvelous diversity, which then man can study, has a unified place, whether it's in knowledge or in values and in life. It was Dadaism which carried the concept of everything being a matter of chance to its logical conclusion of the ultimate absurdity of everything, including humanity. This is Marcel Duchamp's nude descending a staircase. Duchamp perhaps understood most clearly and consciously the absurdity of all things, including man, on the basis of modern man's worldview. Here he carried fragmentation further. The human being disappeared completely. He realized that this absurdity of all things included the absurdity of art itself. This is one of his ready-mades. He took any object near at hand and simply signed it. The philosophers from Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, and Kierkegaard onward had given up a hope of a unity of life and of knowledge, and had come to a fragmented concept of reality. Then the painters painted that way. However, the artists, being sensitive men, came more quickly to the understanding of what the end of this view would be, and that is that all things are absurd. The American Jackson Pollock is perhaps the clearest example of deliberately painting in a way that says all is chance. This is how Pollock went about creating some of his art. Thus his paintings were a product of chance. But wait, is there not order in these lines of paint? Yes, because you see, it is not really chance that shaped his canvases. The universe is not a random universe. It has order. The movement of this swinging can of paint follows the order of the universe itself. The universe is not what these painters said it is. It was a bankrupt humanistic philosophy which first taught that reason leads to pessimism and that optimism is only to be found in the area of non-reason. This basic idea filtered down to art, and then to classical music, and later to popular music. It started with Beethoven's Lost Quartets. You could not call these modern, but there was a shift from the previous music. In France, Claude Debussy opened the door for modern music. Many of us have a profound admiration for his music and enjoy it very much indeed. But Debussy did open the door, not to non-resolution, as the German composers did, but to fragmentation, a fragmentation parallel to the fragmentation in painting. A fragmentation which was a great influence on almost all the following composers of classical music, as well as the later forms of jazz and rock.
in Germany, after Beethoven's quartets, came Wagner and Mahler, then Schoenberg with his 12-tone row. Here's perpetual variation, but never resolution. This is Carl Heinz Stockhausen. You're listening to the published score of electronic music. Concern with the element of chance was part of Stockhausen's work. This ties him in with John Cage. Cage believed the universe is a universe of chance. To express this, he produced music by chance. Cage's music turned out to be sheer noise. Significantly, he entitled this composition Music for Marcel Duchamp. John Cage was another one who could not live with his concept of a chance universe because it does not fit the universe which exists. Cage was an expert in the knowledge of mushrooms. He himself said, I became aware that if I approached mushrooms in the spirit of my chance operation, I would die shortly. His theory of the universe did not fit the universe that exists. Why is the airplane carefully formed and orderly? And what cage produced is utter noise. Because the airplane must fly in the universe that exists. And there are orderly flow lines in the universe that exists. The universe is not what Pollock in his paintings and cage in his music said it was. And because Cage's music does not fit what man is either, it had to become increasingly spectacular to keep us interested. Hey! What a contrast to Bach, who had much diversity and yet always resolution. Bach, 
as a Christian, believed that there was resolution for the individual and for history. As the music that came out of the biblical teaching of the Reformation was influenced by that worldview, so the worldview of modern man shapes modern music. Is this still art? Is it not rather a bare philosophic intellectual statement separated from the fullness of who man is and what the universe is? Tending to be only a bare intellectual statement rather than a work of art, it often has become anti-art art. After philosophy, art, and music, poetry, the novel, and drama became the vehicle for these ideas. In the English-speaking world, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland came first. Le prince d'Aquitaine à la tour abolique, these fragments I have shored against my ruin. Why, then I'll fit you. Hieronymo's mad again. Data, diadvam, damyata. Shanti, shanti, shanti. You see, he matches a fragmented message with a fragmented form of poetry. Just as Picasso opened the way for a fragmented concept of life in Les Damoiselles d'Avignon, so fragmented poetry in the English-speaking world began with T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. Later, Eliot became a Christian, and his form of writing changed from that of the Wasteland. More and more, philosophy was expressed, not as formal statements of philosophy as such, but rather in the novel and other art forms. Sartre wrote Nausea, Camus, The Stranger, and The Plague, and Simon de Beauvoir, L'Envite. <laughs> In the 60s, many of the basic philosophic statements were made through the cinema. And being carried by the cinema, they reached a far wider circle of people than had ever been the case through painting or literature, let alone through the writings of the philosophers. Among these films were Silence and the Hour of the Wolf by Bergman, Juliet of the Spirits by Fellini, Blow Up by Antonioni, Belle du Jour by Buñuel. They showed pictorially and with great force what it is like if people are only machines, and also what it is like if people try to live in the area of non-reason. In the area of non-reason, there is no way to distinguish between right and wrong, or even between what is objectively true and that which is illusion or fantasy. A good example is Antignoni's blow-up. The advertisement for the film reads, murder without guilt, love without meaning. In this film, there are no certainties concerning moral values and no human categories either. Blow Up has no hero. All one has is Antignoni's non-hero. All there is is the camera, which just goes click, 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 and the human factor has disappeared. Some of the films of that period went even further. The Last Year of Marienbad, Juliet of the Spirits, The Hour of the Wolf, and Belle du Jour. They were saying something even more profound. They were saying that as modern man leaps into the area of non-reason to try to find his optimism without reason, that he not only does not have any categories for moral or human values, but he does not have any certainty upon which to distinguish between reality and illusion. The picture has a realistic line. They are no dreams. They are 
Como, como, como... Fantasies of the spirit, there's no difference between the dream and the reality. Pronti a poco. Marisa. Quando prendi Quando prendi un Perché sono un po' di fantasia in quello che fa? Se poi mi devo dire tutto, millimetro per millimetro. Cinta! E là! It, it is uh, my only way to, to, to live in reality, you know, it's, uh, uh, for a creature I think that uh, what he does is, uh, is only reality. E urlate l'altalena dell'amore, tante volte dovete dire l'altalena dell'amore, pronto? Itardita! Come on! To don't give meaning to the reality means that you don't understand no more reality. A reality can appear also like a monstrum things without any meaning. Bergman was a clear case at this point. He directed The Hour of the Wolf, where one cannot tell the difference between what is real and what is fantasy. Was what was being presented really happening, or was it in the mind of one of the characters? If people begin only from themselves and think that they live in a universe in which there is no personal God to speak, a universe such as Bergman indicated in his film Silence, then they have no final way to distinguish between reality and fantasy or illusion. But Bergman, like Sartre and Camus, could not live consistently with his own position. And therefore, the background music for the film Silence is box Goldberg variations. Bergman said, there is a small, holy part of the human being where music speaks. Bergman also said that while he was writing the script for the film Silence, that he had the music of box Goldberg variations playing in his home, and the music interfered with that which was being set forth in that film. The Christian knows why music speaks. He knows the people are not a product of chance. The people are made in the image of God. And on this basis, it is understandable that music is music to man. And because God has spoken in the Bible, there is not silence. And there are certainties concerning moral values and human values. And there are categories upon which to distinguish between reality and fantasy. For the people with the humanist position, this is not so. Within the humanist position, there is no base for knowing. Christianity is not romantic. The Bible is not romantic about man. Man is seen as fallen. Man is seen as rebellion. Man is seen as rebellious against God uh, with all the goodness of God and with all the knowledge he has. On one hand, uh, from the surrounding universe and its form and the mannishness of man, and on the other hand, from the more detailed knowledge of the Bible and the revelation in Christ. Man is a rebel. And we know Ro Christian does not romantically think that this can be just leapt over. But having said that, a Christian is not a pessimist. He's not a pessimist on two levels. First of all, history's going someplace. And a part of the Christian message is that Christ is coming back. And this is the final solution. But every Christian who really uh, understands the scripture, also every generation, he is waiting and fighting and struggling and doing all that he can, not only to see, not only to see individuals become Christians, but the culture touched by these individual Christians. <laughs>
modern man's humanistic thought has come down in many, many forms until at a certain point of history, and I would put it in the early 1960s, people heard this same message coming at them from absolutely every side, whether they read the book of philosophy or they went into the art museum or they listened to music or they read a modern novel or they went to the philosophic cinema. It was always the same. And that is uh, that on the humanistic basis, reason leads to despair, uh, to no answers. And people should try to find answers in the area of non-reason. It had brought people to the place where there were no fixed values whatsoever. These were completely gone. And the great majority of people had come to the place where they had only two horrendous values, absolutely horrible values, personal peace and affluence. Now, because I'm going to use these terms over and over again in this episode, let me define them carefully, and I'd urge you, please listen with care. As I use the term personal peace, I mean I want to be left alone. And I don't care what happens to the man across the street or across the world. I want my own lifestyle to be undisturbed, regardless of what it will mean even to my own children and grandchildren. Now that's what I mean by personal peace. Affluence means things, 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 always more things, and success seen as an abundance of things. In the early 60s, a whole generation had been injected by the teaching that reason leads only to pessimism in the area of a meaning of life and of any values. Students have been hearing this from the professors for a long, long time. Understood, interpreted. One, therefore, is... As a matter of fact, there was a generation that had never been taught anything else. But there was an inconsistency here because most of these professors who taught that life had no meaning and there were no fixed values, they didn't live that way. They were living in the memory of the past. But we should not have been surprised that at a certain point of time, one generation would act, really act, upon what they had been taught. These students looked around them, and they saw these two horrible values of personal peace and affluency being on every side, and they revolted. And that revolution was Berkeley, 1964. Looking back into that which is now past history, we don't understand where we are today unless we take a moment to understand the flow through Berkeley of 1964. They really wanted to escape the two values of personal peace and affluence. And they did it in two different ways. First of all came the drug scene, the hippie scene. And we, we've already seen in a previous episode that Aldous Huxley said that as reason does not, humanistic reason doesn't give a meaning to life, and we can't find objective truth, give drugs to well people uh, in order that they might f try to find truth inside of their own head. The hippie world followed this, and they followed it very explicitly. It was an ideology to them. Let's not make any mistake. Back in those days, it was really an ideology. They really believed in it. They really believed that if you could just take and put uh, drugs into the drinking water, LSD, into the drinking water of the reservoirs of the cities of the world, and you had enough people turned on that civilization's problems would be solved. They believed it with all their heart. Getting high with the help of your friends. It's a very powerful uh, message. About the same time at Berkeley, there arose a second element in this attempt to escape these two terrible values of personal peace and affluency. This was the free speech movement. At first, the free speech movement on Sproul Plaza was neither left nor right. 
It was simply a desire, a demand that they have a right to have freedom, to have political rallies uh, on Sproul Plaza. And by God, people, we have to push Regan right back to the wall, and if we have to, we got to push him right through the wall. And we got to tell him, no, baby, this is our university. But quickly, it slipped into the new left following Marcuse. Marcuse was a German philosopher, a Marxist, and at that time he was teaching at San Diego. This spread over the whole world. We can think, for example, of the Paris riots in 1968. Here they are seeking freedom from these two values. They had the right analysis. Let me say that as somebody who was older. They had the right analysis. This was where our society was, with just two terrible values of personal peace and fluency. But the tragedy was they tried the wrong solutions. The drug culture came to its height at Woodstock at the festival there in 1969. But in Altima in 1969, there was another uh, festival, uh, and uh, the Hell's Angels, who were hired to police the ground, killed at least one man. And the Rolling Stone, the magazine, came out and quoted someone after that as saying, we've lost our age of innocency. The drug culture was finished. It was completely finished after the Isle of Wight Festival in 1970, which ended so ugly, in such an ugly fashion in Europe. After that drug taking changed, mind you, not less people taking drugs unhappily, but no longer taking them as an ideology. The unhappy thing is probably more people are taking drugs and taking them at a younger age. But drug taking as an ideology was absolutely done. The new left went the same way, gradually ground down. It brought forth naturally uh, violence, violence in the United States, violence in Europe. And the idealistic young people really didn't like the violence that it just reasonably and naturally brought forth. In 1970, the radical students bombed the University of Wisconsin lab building, killing a graduate student. Bombs continued to be planted in the United States, and a small, hardcore of radicals continues to exist. But the violence of the new left, climaxing in the bombing of this laboratory building, made most young people in the United States no longer see the new left as a hope. So here the students were, and they had tried to escape these two awful values of personal peace and fluency, and now their two hopes, the new left and the drug thing, was gone. What were they left with? And they were left with apathy. Apathy. Many, many people were so glad when the universities quieted down at that time. And in one way, it's good. It did quiet down. But I could have wept, and I did weep as I met these young people after this. All they had left was apathy. And they had tried to escape their parents' poor values, their society's poor values, and they'd gone around in a circle and come back and ended one inch lower. And now apathy ruled uh, with them. And what was left? The two values of personal peace and affluency now ruled supreme. Now, turning away from the United States, a dominant strong minority in Europe and uh, a majority of students, for example, let's say in South America and other parts of the world, they turn to a new leap into the area of non-reason. And that is, they committed themselves to the Marxist, Leninist, or the Mayist line. Why is this a new kind of leap into the area of non-reason, as utopian in a bad sense as the old drug leap? Well, I'll tell you why. It's simply because everywhere where Marxian-Leninism has come to power, it has always meant oppression, always. And these young people just close their eyes to that. They close their eyes to the fact that oppression is a part of the communistic system. No one has pointed this out more to us than Solzhenitsyn in his emphasis as he's brought it into the Western world in his writings and lecturings. And he has said that 15 million inmates of the prison camps existed at one time in Soviet Russia. He has said that from the communist revolution in Russia until only 1959, 66 million people died for political reasons. So everywhere one looks in the communist world, it always brings forth internal 
oppression. But we must never forget, it also brings forth external oppression. We could think of various things, but the thing which quickly comes to our mind is Hungary and Czechoslovakia. I was living in Switzerland in November 4, 1956, when the Russian tanks moved into Hungary. And at that particular time, I had a radio with a shortwave band. All day long, I listened to the Hungarian students speaking in English, sometime broken English, sometime good English, hoping the external world would listen. I, I was marked by that day. I'll never forget it. Never. Those voices pleading for help. The newspapers, right after that, carried a picture of a beautiful, open-faced, lovely girl called Elon Troth. The picture was a picture of Elon Troth on trial for her life because of her part in trying to stand against the external oppression that Marxist-Leninism naturally brings with it. She was hanged on July 1957. Marxist-Leninism is a leap. It's a leap for another reason, or even a more basic one than the one I've given. Its found foundation, its philosophy, is materialism. Now, all through this series, we've shown that humanism, man beginning from himself, cannot generate any real values or meaning or any real dignity to man. And here is a system that is built completely and consciously and totally on materialism. There is no place for the dignity of man in the materialistic system. So-called communism with a human face that some of the thinkers in communist-controlled countries have pled for, and some outside of communist-controlled countries have also pled for. It isn't possible. It just isn't possible on the basis of materialism. And yet, strangely enough, the young people and older ones in non-communist countries are caught by the idealistic Marxian-Leninism. And it was my conviction after examining the different <clears throat> trends in parties and so forth that the Communist Party um, most held to those ideals. And was the reason is, is that there's so much talk of dignity. Dignity of man, it'd be treated better. In order to solve those problems and in order to give life uh, a meaningful and purposeful life to young people. Where does this come from on a materialistic base? It doesn't. Do you want to know what it is? I'll tell you. And there's only one way to understand idealistic utopian Marxianism, and that is that it's a Christian heresy. And in struggling against and condemning that which is wrong in the world, and Lord knows there's enough of what's wrong in the world, Idealistic utopian communism simply reaches over, takes these words, which could never be produced out of materialistic philosophy, brings them back, uses them, separated from the natural results of their own position, and in doing so, catches these uh, who are caught by idealistic Marxian-Leninism. But when Marxian-Leninism comes to power, it's a different story. It's always oppression, and the will of the majority suddenly has no meaning. Not only does the dignity of the individual cease to exist, but the will of the majority has no meaning either. Now we must understand there are two streams of Leninism, Marxism. They must be kept separate, and we must see these two streams clearly. The first is the idealistic utopian stream. These usually young people, though sometimes older, who have leapt into the area of non-reason. Uh, to accept Marxian Leninism. That's one stream. The second stream is the hardcore Orthodox Communist Party members in various countries outside of the Communist uh, bloc. Now, we find that the danger is that people who have only the two values of personal peace and affluency, if they seem to be promised peace and affluency, by communism, nobody knows what great majorities of these people will do. Nobody knows. More than that, we must see there's a danger in that these two streams of the idealistic Marxian-Leninism and the hardcore Marxian-Leninism Orthodox Party could flow together in a country at a given moment of history and create a situation that would be forever irreversible. And that is a very real danger. 
Подобного рода опасность стоит и перед Соединенными Штатами в целом. This type of danger is uh, before the United States just as well. The United States has also its marks very much upon it, and no more so in any area than the area of the generation of arbitrary law. I want to talk about arbitrary law at some length, actually. Man demanded to be autonomous from God and God's revelation. And what this has re resulted in is relativity, not only in personal and public morals, but in law as law. The nature which men try to build their law on, as we remember back in one of the previous episodes, just is not sufficient for the simple reason that nature is both cruel and non-cruel, and as such you cannot build a stable system of law on nature. And what we're left with, uh, with the, in the humanist flow today in the United States, is purely variable sociological law. Now, by sociological, what I mean is law uh, that is merely based on what some group decides is good for society at a given moment. The man who opened the door for this, perhaps more than anyone else, was Oliver Wendell Holmes. And he wrote in a letter, I'll quote him exactly, the ultimate question is what do the dominant forces of the community want? And do they want it hard enough to disregard whatever inhibitions stand in the way. And this was Oliver Wendell Holmes quite a few years ago. And really what it amounts to is purely variable law. Much modern law is not consistent with the law that has preceded it. And as a matter of fact, we must say that the Constitution of the United States today can be made to say almost anything on the basis of sociological variable law. Now, we must understand that a law today is not just variable law, but that the courts are actually making law. They're not only interpreting the law that the legislative has made, but they actually generate law. Now, Everybody knows who knows anything at all about these things that arbitrary law dominates completely in communistic countries. But what most people don't realize is that on the humanist flow, arbitrary law has swept over into the Western world as well. I'd like to use an illustration. Consider the human fetus, the unborn baby. In January 1973, the United States Supreme Court passed the abortion law. Professor Witherspoon of the University of Texas School of Law writes, the court held that the unborn child is not a person within the meaning of the 14th Amendment, so as to strip all unborn children of all constitutional protection for their lives, liberty, and property. This ruling by the United States Supreme Court is a totally arbitrary absolute. First of all, it is arbitrary medically. This book was put out with the cooperation of many noted scientists in this field, including some from the United States. It was to inform the British public. It favors abortion. However, it says that the question as to when human life begins is an open question. It, abortion, can be carried out before the fetus becomes viable. Although, when that is, is in itself an arguable point. It further states that a biologist might say that human life started at the moment of fertilization when the sperm and the ovum merged. The arbitrariness medically of the Supreme Court decision is underlined by the fact that the destruction of the fetus is accepted in abortion. And yet questions are raised as to whether it is right to fertilize an ovum outside of the womb, that is in the laboratory, because then it would only live for a few days. This points up the problem that if such a fertilized ovum were successfully implanted in the womb, uh, that th it would have the full genetic potential for becoming a human being. 
what does this make the five and a half month old aborted baby to be? Because it too has the full genetic potential for becoming a human being. Justice White of the Supreme Court in his dissent concerning the abortion law said that it is an exercise of raw judicial power, an improvident and extravagant exercise of the power of judicial review. Upon this arbitrary ruling, medically and legally, the abortion laws of almost every state in the union were set aside. Most people accepted uh, this law, even though it was arbitrary medically and legally uh, because it was considered sociologically helpful. Why would we not accept laws curtailing human freedom if these were considered sociologically helpful? What we're left with is sociological law and that is all and nobody knows where it will end. By this Supreme Court ruling the unborn child is considered not to be a person. In our own day, there's been a great outcry, and quite properly, that in the past, the black slave was viewed as a non-person. But now, by this arbitrary absolute brought in on the humanist flow, millions of unborn children of every color of skin are declared by law to be non-persons. <laughs> Now, a question has to be asked. In the day when there are no fixed values, why could not the aged, the incurably ill, the insane, and other classes of persons equally arbitrarily be declared to be non-person on the basis of arbitrary law if the courts thought that it was sociologically helpful? In a day like our own, what's unthinkable today might not prove and probably will not prove unthinkable in a very, very few years. Now, let's move on a bit. As the Christian consensus dies as the basis of our culture, society does not really have many bases upon which it has the possibility of building. One is uh, that everybody would simply do their own thing. And this has the technical name of hedonism. It means everybody would do what they want to do. But the simple fact is that it is not possible to build a society on everybody doing what they want to do. One could think of a single man living on a desert island. He can do <clears throat> anything he wants to do within the form of the universe. But when two men are on that desert island and they have to have interrelationship, it is no longer possible for every man to do what he wants to do. I often think of the illustration of two men trying to do their own thing, regardless of what anybody else thinks, meeting on a narrow bridge. And as they meet on the narrow bridge, something has to happen. They both can't do their own thing. Everybody understands you can't build a society on people doing what they want to do, on hedonism. All right, then, hedonism is a theoretical basis for society after the Christian consensus is gone. <clears throat> but if it's not possible, what other possibilities are there? Well, there's the possibility <clears throat> of the total dominance of the 51% vote. Now remember, it was Christianity, the Reformation Christianity in the north of Europe that brought forth the forms and the freedoms which we have, you know, the 51% vote. But I'm talking about 51% vote after there is no absolute by which to judge the 51% vote. There was a time in the days when the Christian culture was more dominant, when the lone individual could stand up with the Bible in his hand and say, you're wrong, even though the majority has voted the other way. But as the Christian consensus is gone, then there is no absolute by which to judge the 51%. And then this is a very, very different situation. Uh, I'll give you a sentence that I wish you'd memorize. If there is no absolute by which to judge society, society is absolute. The heart of the humanist thinking is making the individual man and then mankind 
the center of all things, his own measure, of making him autonomous. If we're going to live and escape death, not only death uh, individually in the sense of the judgment of God, but death in our culture, in our political life, in our present life, we must turn from that humanist way of making man autonomous, and we must put the Creator at the center of all things. The greatest of all wickedness is putting any created thing in the place of the Creator. And when we turn from this, our feet are turned from the paths of death to the paths of life. There really is only one other alternative uh, left after the Christian consensus is gone, and that is that a single individual or a group will come forth as an elite to give arbitrary absolutes to society. Now we mustn't think this is extreme in our thoughts because many people, many different kind of people have made suggestions in just exactly this direction that this, they say, is what must come into our present society uh, now that the Christian consensus is gone. One man stands out who said this quite some time ago, and that's John Kenneth Galbraith. And he suggested that the intellectuals, and especially the academic world, and especially the scientific world, plus the government, would provide such an elite. Robert Theobald at the Second General Assembly of the World Future Society in June 1975 said, quote, it's naive to deny the necessity for some kind of competent elite, end of quote. Daniel Bell, who's one of the great thinkers of this particular moment of history, has written a book called uh, The Coming of Post-Industrial Society. In it, he says, both government and uh, business has become so technical that the technocrats must become an elite to take over. And he says, this is what's going to happen if we continue in a straight line uh, from where we now are. But in it, he gives a most astute warning, a warning uh, that the lack of a rooted moral belief system is the cultural contradiction of the society the deepest challenge to its survival. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, he means that in this society that we're saying is just, there it is, some sort of an elite, one kind or another, in which all these men and many other thinkers are talking about today. What he's saying is that uh, 
how are they going to generate any real absolute? How are they going to generate any real meaning? How are they going to generate any real ethic? In other words, you could sum up what he's saying, and brilliantly saying, as that in such a society, there is no absolute ethic to accompany the absolute power. Now, that's exactly what stands ahead of us in this matter of an arbitrary elite uh, taking over and giving um, arbitrary absolutes to the community. Humanism has found no way to deal with the problem of morals and ethics and values. And Rousseau's romantic utopian theories led to the violence of the French Revolution and to the guillotine. Now, when we begin to talk about an authoritarian elite, please do not think of the model of Hitler and Stalin. That would miss the mark completely. What we're facing is something much, much more subtle something of which Hitler and Stalin would not provide the model at all. Rather, it's in all probability going to be a manipulative authoritarian elite. A manipulative authoritarian elite. In episode six, if you can remember back to episode six at the end of that on science, we showed many of the suggested forms of manipulation that have been suggested by various people and some of which are already in practice. We spoke of the press reports of Dr. Kessler's suggestion of chemical agents to rid man of aggression. Dr. Cranty's suggestion of using birth controls in the world's drinking supply. Dr. Clark's suggestion that all political leaders should take anti-aggression pills. Dr. Lee's suggestion that all public officials should take annual psychological tests. And of course, Skinner's use of reinforcers to modify man's behavior. But there was one that we didn't touch on at that time that really is going to be increasingly important in the days ahead, and that's the problem of genetic engineering. Francis Crick, who with James Watson discovered the DNA code, has spoken out very strongly in favor of full genetic engineering. Quote, some group of people should decide that some people should have more children and some should have fewer. You have to decide who is to be born, end of quote. Now, that's only one little part of it, though, because as you read carefully on further, what you find is the call for a group of people, and he doesn't call it an elite, but it certainly would be the elite, who will determine what kind of people we want genetically in the future. And then we'll set out genetically to make them. Now, many of the technical breakthroughs have been made. Now, when people believed, indeed, that man was made in God's image, there was a real basis for humanness. I'm saying humanness, for people being human. But once this is removed, as it has been now so largely removed for the loss of the Christian consensus, uh, there is no reason, once we see people merely as a machine, as not qualitatively different from non-people, non-man, there's no reason why we should not tinker with them. As a matter of fact, uh, Francis Crick in this article uses that word tinker. There's no reason why we shouldn't tinker with them genetically, and there's no reason we shouldn't manipulate them, and there is no reason why we shouldn't control them. And, of course, we must think of manipulatory possibilities of television. It has its own tremendous possibilities. Violence broke out again last night, as some young people were prevented from meeting peaceably in the downtown area by noticeably nervous, if not to say, trigger-happy police. Frank Bushman, attorney for the young people who are to be arraigned in court tomorrow morning, pointedly remarked on this overreaction by the police. I hereby declare this an unlawful assembly. Late last night, disorder broke out among a small, unruly mob as our guardians of the peace quietly and efficiently, in spite of extreme provocation, restored order. I command you to disperse, and if you do not, you shall be arrested for refusal to disperse. You have two minutes to disperse. The 
It is important that our courts make an example of these hoodlums and hand out the kind of sentences they so richly deserve. We staged this scene. We filmed it to show the television can tell any story that it wants to tell. In both versions, the action was the same, and the actors did exactly the same things. However, the camera was placed differently. The editor edited differently, and the announcer told a different story. We would be naive not to realize that what we're seeing is an edited symbol. But the nature of TV is such, we see it with our own eyes, that we naturally look at it as though it were objective truth. For many, what they see on television is more true than what they see with their eyes in the external world. Let me stress, it is always unfair to say the media does this or the press does that. There are always individuals or individual publications, for example, that are not included in the generalization. But the mass media can be used by an authoritarian manipulating government or an elite. The elite gives the arbitrary absolutes. And then not only TV, but all the mass media can be used for manipulation. And a plot or conspiracy are not needed. All that is needed is that the people in the places of influence and those who decide what is the news have in common the modern results of humanism, the modern worldview, which we have considered at length in this series. When the perspective, the worldview of the elite, coincides with some of the influential news carriers, it does not have to be all, then either consciously or unconsciously, the media becomes an instrument for manipulation. Now, what will all these available uh, manipulatory techniques mean in our own countries? I'm not thinking of communist countries now, countries that have gone totally totalitarian, but in our own countries. There will be people who will feel uncomfortable with the increased control and increased manipulation. But there's a dilemma here. It's a very profound one. And the dilemma is that many of the people who speak out for civil liberties are also totally committed to the fact that the government has the responsibility to solve every problem. And there's a natural tension, a torque, in these two things uh, as they think both things. Now, as the pressures increase, and they just overwhelmingly increase as time goes on, at a certain point, where is the line going to be drawn? Certainly, if they have only the values, the basic values of personal peace and fluency, at a certain point, their disquiet will be totally submerged. The Christian consensus gave us such tremendous freedoms. Of course, as we've said many times, the basic Christian message is that an individual can be right with God only upon the basis uh, of the work of Christ alone. That's all he needs. And the humanist element has gone out of that. But it carried with it, of course, many, many secondary things. And one was, uh, one secondary thing was this tremendous range of freedom uh, that we've been talking about. Freedom that didn't lead to chaos. But now listen, don't you see that if you can have these titanic freedoms not leading to chaos because of the Christian consensus providing a form, if you remove that Christian consensus as a form, then the very freedoms which have been such a, a glory and a wonder that we have had from the Christian consensus, these very freedoms then become the hammer blows to destroy everything and to lead completely to chaos. In other words, the good thing becomes the poor thing once the consensus, the form, is removed. Now that's exactly exactly what has occurred. Now coming and thinking of the United States, we could think of other countries in the Western world, but I'll choose the United States. From what source might the uh, authoritarian manipulating government come? Most people immediately, of course, think of the administrative side, a president with too much power, but the administrative side isn't the only place to think, keep your eyes on. Now, it's true that it's harder to think practically of the congressional side bringing forth such an authoritative government, but it's not unthinkable. 
a public official serving on the very highest level in the United States at one point said a very wise thing. What he said was, and I'm quoting, legislative dictatorship is no better than executive tyranny. And he's absolutely right. It isn't, it isn't a question of from what side of the government the authoritarian manipulative government comes. The problem is it's coming. The fact that it is, the danger is there. And now we come to what I would say is the chief point. With variable sociological law, the court's generating law must not be ruled out as the source of the place from where authoritative manipulating government would come from. Someone has used the term of the imperial judiciary. It's a very good term in our modern setting. And don't forget that as we talk of the rise of authoritarian government, that the words right and left really lose their meaning in a certain way. I'm not saying that they don't have a meaning, but you must see something deeper than this. And that is the right and the left are really only two roads leading to the same end. The problem is not choosing between one or the other. The problem rests at a more crucial point, and that is the elite. The authoritarianism as such, filling the vacuum which has been left by the loss of the Christian consensus, filling the vacuum and forcing a form on society so that it will not go into chaos. This is the real problem. And with most people, the young and the old, committed to apathy, and most of the populations of the various countries being committed to the values of personal peace and affluency. Do you think they will stand up at great cost against such a trend as long as they are promised the affluency and the personal peace? Will they not rather give their position up, give up even their liberties step by step, one after another, as long as they have the, as the illusion, even the illusion of personal peace and affluency? The weak humanistic ideals have not been able to provide a base which is needed. Let us remember what humanism is. It's man demanding to begin autonomously from himself and turning away completely from anything God might have to say. And these, this kind of humanism, this humanism, was not able to provide in the past and the present, nor will it in the future, a support strong enough uh, for society that will still give us freedoms. It's not able to. Do you remember in the first episode, the little Roman bridge? And as I stood there on that Roman bridge, I pointed out that these little humpbacked Roman bridges over many of the rivers of Europe have stood safely for two millennia as horses, mules, cows, wagons, people went over them. <clears throat> but if you drove a modern truck over them, the bridge would break. Now that's exactly where the humanist ideals take us. As long as the pressures are not there, it may seem to be really saying something and saying something rather nice. But as the pressures increase, that's a very different situation. And don't forget the pressures are increasing. I can name uh, just a certain number of them. You could might think of more. But the ones I'm going to mention are not something for the future. They're already upon us. And these pressures are building up month after month, year after year. The first is the dilemma of economic breakdown, centered in the what seems to be the impossibility to control inflation. And economists everywhere are writing on the fact that we haven't found a solution to the control of inflation. And if it continues, it will lead in country after country to economic breakdown. We can think of political terrorism and indiscriminate terrorism as it is spread over the world. This brings a tremendous pressure uh, on people, just a tremendous pressure. And perhaps the greatest of all, the threat of war with the imperialistic, expansionist, communist countries toward the West. And add to this the fear of atomic war. Just a tremendous pressure to give up anything, to give up absolutely anything, if we could just save our peace and affluency. 
and then there is the shortage of food in the world and other natural resources and this brings with it the fact that there almost certainly is going to be a redistribution of wealth in the world and a redistribution of power and this is a tremendous pressure and any of these pressures as they're growing and as they will certainly continue to grow people with merely the values of personal peace and affluency would give up anything in the light of these pressures especially if in the days of uh, our own day as in the days of Augustus back in the Roman Empire the things were brought in the changes were brought in while seeming to keep the outward forms of constitutionality and with the growth of these pressures modern man with his apathy and with his desire for personal peace will crush just like that little Roman bridge would crush under the weight of a 10 ton truck it's just where we are now what are the alternatives? Well, in the natural flow of things, there would seem to be only two. One, an imposed order. And we spent a long time in this episode and looking back into other episodes about the possibility of this imposed order. Or, in the natural flow of things, just one other alternative. And that is that our society would affirm the base that gave us the form and freedoms in the first place. That is a return to God's revelation in the Bible and as he has revealed himself in Christ. This was the base that gave us the forms and the freedoms. And it would seem as though these are the only two alternatives. Imposed order or our society affirming the base that gave us the form and freedoms in the first place. But I want to say something as a warning immediately. Christianity cannot be accepted merely as a means to an end, sociologically. It cannot be accepted merely as a superior utilitarianism. Christianity is truth, and it demands a commitment to that truth. It means there is an infinite God who is there, and he has created all things. Things are not a product of chance. This infinite personal God has created the heavens and the earth. He has created the space-time continuum. It means the acceptance of Christ as Savior and as Lord. And when we accept him as Lord, it means that we come to live under the absolutes, the moral absolutes, which the Bible gives even if it sets us apart, as it did the early Christians, from the surrounding culture. In this place, there are morals, there are values, there is meaning, and very specifically, there's meaning for man in this place. But we must understand that what is involved here is truth, not a truth which is a leap into a area of non-reason, but a truth that gives us a unity of all of knowledge and all of life. And then this alternative means that the people who have this base influence the surrounding consensus, regardless of the cost. Just as the early church in the days of the Roman Empire, they spoke out regardless of the cost. It means we have a responsibility before God once we have this base to influence society across its whole spectrum and the whole spectrum of life. And happily, and this is important to think about, Christians do not need to be in a majority in order to influence the consensus. There was a Jew who was a Christian who wrote a book to the Romans in about the year 60. He had previously talked to the thinking people in Greece near the Acropolis at Mars Hill. And what did he say to the people of his generation, the thinking people? He said, your worldview does not explain the existence of the universe or its form, and it does not explain the uniqueness of man. Your thought form does not explain those things. And yet, you refuse, you suppress that which does give an answer to both the existence of the universe and its form and the uniqueness 
of man. Let me quote from the letter which he wrote. The retribution of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known is evident within them. And here he's talking about the unique mannishness of man. Man is different from non-man. Because that which is known of God is evident within them. For God made it plain to them. For the invisible things of him since the creation of the world are clearly seen, being perceived by the things that are made. And here he's talking about the universe and its form. For the invisible things of him since the creation of the world are clearly seen, being perceived by the things that are made, even his eternal power and divinity, so that they are without excuse. He says that the universe and its form and the uniqueness of man speak without conflict giving the same message that the Bible gives in greater detail. And we must say to the humanist man of our own day the same thing as he said to the thinkers of his day. Humanist man demanding to begin autonomously from himself has no answer uh, for the existence of the universe and its form or for the uniqueness of man. And yet they reject the answer that really gives an answer that this God exists, and he's not been silent, but has spoken in the Bible and through Christ, has indeed as a central message that people may approach freely to God on the basis of the work of Christ. But it carries many other things with it. And for this series of studies uh, to which we are now coming to a close, the most important thing is to remember those titanic freedoms uh, which it has given to us without these freedoms leading to chaos. And this is our hope for the future. It is either this or an imposed order. People act upon the basis of what they think. The problem is not outward things. The problem is having the right worldview and acting upon it. The worldview that gives men and women the truth of what is.